uh, okay, let me see. Sweden. I'm fascinated by this country so much so that <clears throat> you know I, I uh, you know I, I I'm the very opposite of a Swede, but somehow I, I, I felt in Sweden at home. Uh, strangely, it was the only country in the world where I felt uh, at home. So I'll show you some examples, including. Uh, uh, so I will start actually with um, with uh, Zygmunt Leverenz, and uh, then I'll show Gunnar Asplund and Johan Chelsing. <coughs> so happy birthday, Zygmunt! Uh, a very interesting man. Not only that he studied uh, for three years uh, mechanical engineering, but he also gave up architecture for more than 10 years when he um, started a factory to produce, uh, uh, you know, uh, architectural, um, you know, uh, how to call them uh, entities or items, you know, or elements uh, that, that he designed. <clears throat> and then after more than 10 years, he returned to, uh, personally, I think he was fighting with depression a little bit, although he had a long life, he, he died at 90. And I like, like absolutely everything about him, except that he smokes a cigar. But, you know, architects who, when be, they become famous, they, they do have a friendship with a cigar. I don't know why very well. Uh, Wolf Briggs too, and of course, Mies and others. Anyway, this is a, a, a chapel uh, in, uh, in uh, Malmö. Malmö is a, is, a, is a magical city. I, I spent two days there and I, I felt like immigrating again there. Are you showing already something done? I don't see anything. Ah, uh, you don't see anything, sorry. Uh, <laughs> of course not because, uh, sorry, I, I forgot the ritual. Uh, <clears throat> and, and you're recording, you need to record. Yes, I am recording, but I forgot to, to share the screen. I'm sorry, thank you for letting me no. know. No problem. Okay, share. Okay, do you see now the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, so we start with, um, with uh, Zygmunt Leverenz, and then I'll have another PowerPoint presentation uh, just about him. So this is a, a chapel. Um, I, I like the modesty and the, you know, the, 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 well, it's almost some kind of an art de povera. And I, I like this very much because in the field of spirit, you know, what can you do? You know, you cannot assert yourself in, uh, I mean, it has been done, of course, in the history of the world. There are opulent churches, very much so. But in the 20th century, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's less justifiably uh, possible. Uh, I mean, look at this window. It's, it's, I, I, I think it has genius. It, it's, it's a window that uh, it, it's, 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 it's both opening the interior towards the outside, but it's also, uh, it's also telling you there is no way to escape. And it's uh, artistically, it's done very, very well. It is articulated. Uh, uh, I mean, architecturally, uh, very well, and it, it's, it's cryptic. It's, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think he had a, a great uh, sense for uh, creating uh, unique windows. And uh, I, I, I listened to an interview with Alvaro Siza, who said that the window is the most important element in architecture. And he quoted Frank Lloyd Wright, who said, architecture would be very easy if we didn't have to put windows. And uh, it's true. Uh, a window uh, is uh, is not is not easy to 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 envision the, the right window in the right place in a building because uh, it is in a way uh, it represents the violence of, of a wall. And uh, even uh, Dilar and Scofidio wrote a poem about uh, the window. Anyway, uh, I'm not going to read that poem now because it would be hard for me to find. But uh, maybe uh, another time. Anyway, this is very interesting, and we can we can talk just about this image for a while. You know, what what did he want to say? On the other hand, Sigurd Leverenz was a, a great master of, of tectonics. Of uh, uh, I mean, he worked with the brick and bricks, and uh, you know, in, in in beautiful ways. And and because today we were supposed to also talk about Calatrava, 
I personally miss this, this, uh, the earthiness of, of this architecture in Calatrava's work. You know, you don't see the masonry work, uh, but in, in uh, Sigurd Leverent you do. Masonry is extremely, extremely important. And uh, masonry that is not hidden behind, uh, you know, cosmetic uh, plaster or whatever. No, it shows itself. It shows how the building was built. And not only that, this is very interesting. I read in that uh, book that I admire so much and that I should read with more carefully than I did uh, until now, Constructing Architecture, where Andrea de Plas says, well, true masonry initially was not meant, it's very provocative, uh, this statement, but it was, it was influenced by Gottfried Zemper, who in uh, at, uh, ETH uh, in Zurich, uh, Gottfried Zemper was um, the founding father, father almost, uh, that initially the world was not, had, didn't have a structural function. They have very provocative uh, thought because we think of a wall that is built in order to support the roof and, uh, and so on. No, no. He said that uh, um, initially the wall had rather an ornamental, um, but here, maybe I don't explain very well, an ornamental role. That is because uh, Zemper thought that the first architectonic gesture that the primitive man who didn't yet have a house was, was to, to co collect uh, vegetable material from bushes and, and trees and weave them. And in the act of weaving, he created some you know, approximations that were not yet walls. But there were um, panels uh, 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 with a certain degree of, uh, of flexibility, where because they were woven, there was implicit some kind of uh, uh, or or ornamentation there, although it was not um, in intended or uh, explicit. Uh, but it's an it's an interesting theory to you. You see, even here. The way he built the, the masonry wall is, you know, he didn't have to use different colors of, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if I can call them bricks, uh, probably not. The, the seed, there is an element of uh, ornamentation here that is, uh, it cannot be justified in or explained in terms of uh, uh, structure. Uh, <clears throat> also, I think in the case of Sigurd Leverence, there is a, very subtle way in which he um, uh, uh, he, uh, he indicates uh, the beyond in a way. You know that uh, you know. Look, this could be. You see here some kind of a ruin now, uh, and and there is a canopy that covers the transition between the building and the the, the outside, and so in a way you have the the in betweenness. Uh, uh, you know the the chapel and uh, and uh, you know the the outer world, and and this fragility, this intermediate space, I think is uh, uh, very important. Um, so I think there is great richness in the smallest detail in some of his buildings, and this richness, of course, in terms of. Uh, um, you know, structural flamboyance and, uh, you know, explosion of forms and so on. Calatrava is very, very inciting. But what Cal Calatrava doesn't have is the richness in a square inch, so to speak, which Leverence does have. And you'll see he's very, uh, he's very, very uh, innovative in uh, working with very small, uh, the almost insignificant uh, parts of the building, parts that we usually actually neglect. So you see the chapel here. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, spectacular at all, but I think that is a quality, not, not necessarily a, a problem. Then St. Peter's Church, but we'll come back to this when I have the larger presentation on him. Now, this is another brilliance. I mean, look at this. Again, talking about that gesture uh, of, of uh, insinuating uh, a meaning, and that is the, the transition between, the, between what we call life 
and what we call death. And you see those, those uh, tiles that advance uh, in, in, in their uh, fragility towards the, towards the, you know, the, the tomb in a way, towards the, towards the hole in the ground. And it's a very, very poetical and I think very, very beautiful way to say without words uh, a lot. <clears throat> and I think this is the role of architecture to invent, to find ways for a, a narration that uh, uh, doesn't need words. You express yourself tectonically uh, through a design. It's excellent. I mean, uh, it's abstract. It's, uh, it's not so cryptical, but it is mysterious. And those uh, five tiles that advance precariously towards um, the darkness, are, I, I, I find them, uh, I don't know how else to, to put it, but um, this is, uh, this is the poetry of architecture. And look at the floor, you know, the floor is, uh, is, is the real thing. It's not mimicking anything. It is, it is what it is. You, you get what you see. And it's, it's, there is a certain roughness, but there is also gentleness. There is, uh, uh, there is a, a fragility even in the way they are positioned, uh, uh, you know, the bricks. And uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's an excellent work. And look at this. I mean, uh, you know, who would have done this? Only a poet of architecture, that's all I can say. And, and, and actually, you know, this, is, this can be done by any of us for any kind of building. You know, if you understand what you would like to communicate and if you are deeply there, present in the in the in, in, in the making of the building, you can propose very very uh, convincing and satisfying uh, uh, details that are not that do not cost anything really. I mean, you know, here you anyone could have done something like this, but I didn't see in all my travels through architecture something similar except here. Now look at other windows by him, you know, of course there is a problem here that you cannot easily open the, them, uh, but uh, I, I also think it's a, it's a commentary on, on, uh, on uh, in, in mysterious ways on the dialogue between the inside and the outside, you know, it's, it's also almost kind of like a person who wears dark glasses as, um, you know, many of the stars do. You know, so you, you don't see their eyes, but uh, you see sometimes yourself reflected in those uh, dark glasses. Here, you don't see, uh, I mean, it, it, it depends on the condition of the light, but, but, but the, the, the continuous change, depending where, where you position yourself and on the, on the time of the day, actually, uh, uh, the building becomes uh, very different just because of the reflection by these, uh, uh, you know, fixed uh, windows. Again, the, 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 the magnificence, I think, of the, of the brick wall. Uh, and I, I love this. I, in fact, once being exasperated that I, 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 I didn't build and I couldn't build, I made a ser series of large, a large series of pastel drawings, 18 inches by 24 inches, called the living wall. And it's too bad I don't have here pictures, but maybe some other time I can show them to you. Where I was actually, <laughs> and pathetically, uh, 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 kind of building on paper with bricks and so on. And uh, uh, I, most of the time brick, but not just brick, also stone and wood. And I, I, I did them so uh, in a way, uh, I don't know how to put it convincingly because when I put the, the drawing, the pastel drawing on a wall and when uh, an art dealer where I was supposed to have an exhibition in New York saw the pictures, the sunlight uh, um, stroke the, um, uh, the pastel drawing. <laughs> so it wasn't a real a brick wall, it was a pastel drawing of a brick wall and uh, I remember the, 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 the art dealer said, you know, a beautiful wall, uh, you know, and I said, it's not a wall, it's, 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 the, it's the pastel drawing of a wall. I admire very much this, uh, the, you know, the 
to me, this is beauty. You know, you have a brick above another brick and you see the, you know, the inevitable, uh, in, in, but I cannot call them imperfections. You know, this is, this is how a, a world that doesn't lie is built. And, and uh, I, I, I think that is, it's a symphonic little work, you know, if I can call it uh, symphonic. It's, I think it's very, very nice. And, uh, you know, I trust such a building. I trust such a door. I, I trust such a wall. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's modest and it's not lying. And uh, it, I, it's very reassuring for me. Now, here is the, uh, an, an, a corner entrance, which is also an event, you know, done with the simplest means. So again, uh, Sigurd Leverenz is telling us, you can do architecture, good architecture, without uh, flamboyant gestures, uh, without uh, great expenditures, it just uh, is reflecting on your human condition, on the limits of life. And uh, also, it doesn't mean it's not a celebration of life, because I think this building is. Anyway, we'll, we'll come back to, to this uh, building. He built uh, two, two churches, and this is one of them. And uh, here also, there are beautiful things in terms of structure. Uh, and it, it's a structure that is, um, is uh, it is structure, but it's also ornamental. And here you see, you know, uh, a detail of one of those, um, you know, if we, if we can call them uh, windows, uh, that we saw before. Um, yeah, look at, look at the ceiling, <clears throat> look at the vaults, you know. Uh, the architecture is extremely beautiful when you understand that you can be creative at all levels. And, uh, you know, you, you can create an event, again, with simple means. Uh, this is architecture. This is architecture at its best. And it's not, again, it's not the rhetorical architecture the way uh, Calatrava often is. This is not rhetorical. This is, uh, it has poetry, it has mystery. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not prosaic at all. Uh, it, it, I think it's architecture. Uh, that's all. I, I should not even use capital A. No, it, it's architecture. That's it. And you see here also the tension between the, you know, uh, the door, which is uh, uh, so, you know, humble and is not protected, is not the wood is not protected, and then the 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 these these mirrors, these mirrored uh, windows, uh, you think they are mirrors, but they are uh, windows actually, and. Uh, here is the tension between uh, a gesture that is. Uh, you know, uh, almost uh, traditional, and then you have the, 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 the unconventional gesture, which is the use of these, uh, um, you know, mirrored windows. This is, a, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this. Uh, very, very interesting architect. And uh, he deserves a better, a better study than I was able to, to, to do until now, but uh, it, it is my pleasure to introduce him to you, and I'm sure you can continue the study because today is very easy to, to if you like a subject, you can find a lot about uh, about about it on, on the web. And again, you see, this is not an architecture that uh, tries to seduce you with, uh, you know, beautifications. No, you even have a rusted uh, iron and you have I think he understood correctly what architecture is. Architecture is not about cosmetics. It's not about hiding. It's about revealing. I mean, I mean, I'm not totally correct because hiding, hiding is also part of, of architecture, but it's not that kind of hiding that I was attacking. It's, it's hiding uh, uh, not through you know uh, layers of cosmetic uh, beautification. That that was the one I was uh, against. I, I love brick. It's true. I love brick, um, and many people love bricks. It's hard not to love bricks, really. 
Now look at these lamps, I, I call them, and you'll see them in, a, in other pictures in the larger presentation on Zigur Leverence. Um, I, I call them morning lamps uh, because they are part of a, a religious complex. They are a little bit inclined, you know, and, uh, and uh, I ask myself, why did he do it so, you know? Maybe, you know, it's like someone who lowers his head or her head because enters into a space that uh, requires to be uh, a little more, um, you know, uh, discreet and and pensive and 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 these lamps also I, I see them as as, uh, as I, I call them uh, morning lamps. I don't know if uh, I was inspired when I thought of it, but I thought of it. Okay, so. Uh, they're either morning or they're deferential. Pardon? They are either morning or they are deferential. Yeah, or deferential, sure. Uh, thank you. Um, I never saw this before, except uh, in his architecture, and he, he designed them. Very interesting uh, architect. He didn't study architecture. He had some apprenticeship in Germany after he studied for three years uh, mechanical engineering. And I don't know exactly what that apprenticeship was. But look at this, you know. I mean, I, I like the fact that it's so, you know, it's almost, uh, it, 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 it's, 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 it's you, you, you could almost say, you know, this cannot be Sweden because Sweden is, uh, you know, renowned for its uh, being very exact and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, they do things uh, well, or if not perfectly. But here, there is an intentional uh, level of, um, you know, roughness or completeness, even in a way. Mm. And, and this, this, uh, can, this... Can I say something about this? Uh, just the impression. I have never seen this before, but in some ways, by expressing the window in this way with the frame on the outside and the fixings very visible uh, on the outside, he's almost converting the, the window into something like a picture that's hanging on the wall. You usually think of a window as a penetration into another world that's beyond and you can't see all of it. And here he's like saying, no, you see a picture that's kind of superimposed on this surface, which is which is the wall. Uh, it's a very different uh, sense of what a window is. Right. So, what do you think made him, uh, you know, uh, create this kind of, uh, you know, uh, arrangement, if I can call it? So, this, what, what, what does he want to say with this? What do you think? Uh, that's a very difficult one, mm. because I'm sure there's something deeper than just trying to create an effect for the sake of it. Exactly. And that's what I'm trying to say. What yeah. I, I'm sure he wants to say something with this. And, and it's not just uh, aesthetics here. In some ways, uh, if you think about what is expressed on the window, which is either a reflection of what's behind you, or of uh, at nighttime, I assume that you will see more of what's going on on the inside. Uh, I, I think uh, that punched openings in a wall are usually a, a negative, and this is a positive. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, uh, very, very interesting thoughts. So uh, you, you say that this is positive, it's not the usual, um, you know, Making a hole in the in the wall to 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 break to break through, but it's a uh, as Mahadev said, it's it's uh, almost like uh, you know hanging a picture on the wall, and and this picture on the wall also brings light into the building, and maybe at night, I mean not maybe at night, in fact like now you you can also see uh, a little bit the inside, and you also see the reflection of the outside. This this is uh, this can be done with any window, of course. But here the effect is amplified uh, uh, by by the fact that uh, uh, you know if it's, it's not the typical window where you you can open it. It's not even a fixed window. It's it's something yes 
suspended on the wall or like, like a picture, you know, on the wall, you know, mm. hanged on the wall. Maybe which, which has the effect of reinforcing the solidity of the wall beyond, right? Uh, it's not a penetrated wall, uh, certainly visually or in the sense that you get from it. Now, considering what you said, that it's like a picture hang, hanging on, on, on the wall, you'd expect behind it to, to still have the wall, right? Just like in... Yes, in uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and the paradox is that now behind it is a hole. And mm. uh, yeah, there is a level of uh, ambivalence. I don't know if I am... Uh, I don't want to, to, to blame the spider for, for my lack mm. of sufficient intelligence, but... I, I feel this is uh, this is worth continuing to talk about uh, one day or maybe mm. even now later uh, or even now because it's it's a trademark for him in a way this mm. this this in way some ways even though you know there is a hole beyond the spirit of the wall is continuing through that plane whereas when you have a punched window you're definitely breaking the the spirit of the wall. I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, yeah, uh, just are you so kind? Are you so kind to repeat, if you can? I, oh, I sorry. Uh, uh, my microphone is not very good, but uh, I was saying that in this, you very the even though you know there is a hole beyond beyond the glass, the spirit of the wall is kind of continued in this presentation of the wall. Yes, yes, I think, yes, you said it very well. In a way, maybe this so-called window is telling us, well, I am a window, but before I became a window, here was a continuous wall, and, and I, I just, uh, I, I'm uh, like a second thought. I, I, mm. I, I came upon uh, this wall, I broke it, but, but the spirit of, of the wall, as you said, uh, kind mm. of continues in its integrity. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think there is a, I don't know if I express myself well, but I think I understand what you want to say, Mahadev, that... Mm. Uh, and, and, no, I, th I think you got it, yeah. Mm. It's, it's mm. very interesting, yes. Mm. That you see, with simple means, you have a wall and you have a window, a, you have a piece of glass. Now maybe it's, a, you know, a special, it looks like, a, you know, kind of a special glass, but uh, uh, it's an event. And there is something else, you know, when there are repairs to be done, like here in the corner above the, above the, above the door, I think even if this repair is not done, uh, you know, perfectly, the the wounds, the wounds of the building, uh, are are not necessarily uh, something negative or something to be to try to avoid or to be afraid of, and and uh, and it's like in an old sweater where there is a hole at one moment and you you try to repair it, and maybe you even use a different kind of wool. Uh, or the different color, or I don't know what, and you can see it, it was ripped. But, mm. but that, that uh, repair work, even if it's not done in such a way that you won't see th that, that it was wounded, the sweater, somehow that, that uh, so-called defect could actually become a quality. Because this uh, you know, intervention above the door there you could, if you have a little bit of imagination and maybe even without a, a little bit of imagination, it's like, a, you know, an informal kind of ornament and uh, it's fine. But I don't think you can do this easily with our methods of construction today. You need a woven wall and uh, it's the same like with a woven sweater. That's why I think it's extremely important to bring back weaving into architecture because then the repair can be done in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, simple and organic and uh, uh, unexpected, unex unexpensive, inexpensive uh, ways and uh, aesthetically, uh, you know, 
well, I mean, it's aesthetically, uh, uh, you know, maybe even adding something to the building. If we look at this, uh, this facade of the building, you know, I don't know exactly when it was built, maybe immediately after the war, but it has, it has at least 60 years uh, or so, seven, well, 70 uh, almost. Um, I, I think it's, it's uh, if you do this, such a thing today, uh, you know, you, you still be considered kind of an iconoclast because of the, of those pictures of the outside hanging on the, on the outside wall. Mm. So this is the other church. Uh, I, I don't know what to do because in the other presentation, but you know, okay, well, we'll repeat uh, presenting the same works, but with different slides. Um, the differential uh, lamp. Uh, and yeah, brick is, uh, is, uh, is a good friend of, of the trees. Uh, we don't see this kind of, uh, you know, uh, intimate, uh, uh, you know, uh, peaceful uh, meetings between nature and man in Calatrava's work. This is a different kind of architect, you know, is um, not trying to impress. Uh, plus, the natural context is always uh, of primal importance. This is the man. Hmm. Now we'll see some works by Asplund and Leverance, and I will also show uh, have another presentation just on Asplund. So today we'll talk a lot about Sweden because I think it's an occasion to become a little more uh, immersed into that uh, that culture. By the way, of uh, of Leverance. So this is the Chapel of the Resurrection in the Woodland Cemetery, which I visited. And this is, 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 is a beautiful work, if I can um, call a cemetery beautiful, but I think it can be also from 1936. So, um, you know, 85 years old almost. But this, this particular chapel was built by, by uh, Leverance. And, and you can see here, um, of course, the, um, you know, the reference to classical, so-called classical architecture. There is a book published by MIT uh, called The Leverance and the Dilemmas of uh, Classical Architecture. I didn't read it, but I, I, I found out about it today and uh, I like the title. Uh, even here you have, uh, you have, uh, you know, even if he used historical, um, you know, architectural uh, components or elements, but uh, the, the force, the primal force of the main uh, part of the building is, uh, is a modern gesture because it doesn't have any opening. Uh, Uh, someone told me, a friend of mine, that uh, he noticed that the Swedes seem to be very concerned with uh, with the afterlife, with cemeteries. With uh, yeah, they build a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, and, and and maybe this shows that says something about the the level of their uh, um, if I can call it so existential uh, sophistication or the, the seriousness they take life seriously. And uh, you cannot take life seriously, ignoring, uh, you know, the afterlife. So um, there are two, um, they work together for this cemetery. And here you see one is by uh, Asplund. Let's, let, me, let me read again. So the one on the left is by Leverens and the one on the right <clears throat> by Asplund. They are both good. <clears throat> this is done from what I know by Asplund, but maybe uh, I, I know that at one moment uh, <clears throat> Sigurd Leverance became disappointed for some reason and he left 
he left his work, he left the team, but it, he was involved in the first stages. They won a competition. This is truly a great, uh, a great uh, cemetery, Woodland in, in Stockholm. If you arrive there, I, I, uh, I, I suggest to you to visit it because it will be a, a, a unique experience. Now a younger, much younger architect, he is about uh, 50, 55 now. Uh, his father was also a famous architect and he built this Lutheran church in Stockholm, which would surprise us because it doesn't look like a church at all. No, no, sorry, this is a crematorium, but we, we should see the church too. I don't know, I, uh, sorry about this. Um, maybe I'll show it later. <clears throat> this is a crematorium also on the Woodland Cemetery. Uh, so not far away from the works by Gunnar Rasplund and uh, Sigurd Leverens, showing the same kind of, by the way, Chelsing, uh, Johann Chelsing is organizing each year the Stockholm uh, Symposium. He promotes a, a robust architecture. Uh, and so almost like in a polemical, it was deconstruction and so on. He has an interesting position, and this building, I think, is, is uh, uh, illustrates that. You know, uh, uh, Charles Baudelaire, <clears throat> the great French poet, uh, whom I admire so much, and who was also a great art critic. He had uh, he put it very simply, and I think very correctly. He said, "Art has two halves. One half is concerned with the uh, ephemeral, the circumstantial, the temporary." <coughs> and the other half with the eternal and the immutable. And, and you have to have both. And so what we see here is, yes, this is a modern man, our contemporary, but uh, he has an eye, so to speak, on the eternal and the immutable. And uh, uh, not too many people do that these days. Uh, he understands also the, the importance of a column that moment when a column reaches a floor, uh, the slab, and you see here also that the, the slab, the, the flooring is uh, as honestly, um, um, you know, displayed uh, as it looks <coughs> uh, to leverance. This is the church that was mentioned before, the Lutheran church, and it looks like a house. <coughs> But uh, it's, well, you know, initially maybe a church was just that, a house. But you see what the difference between, it's maybe because of the quality of the glass. Here, the glass is not like in uh, Sigurd Leverand's uh, case. You know, here you can, it's still uh, attached to the, on the front of the, of the, of the wall, but, you don't get that feeling that it's a picture hanging on the wall towards the outside, as, as we got uh, with Ziegler Leverance. What do you think? Is it because of the quality of the glass that was used? I think, I think it's the scale as well. Yes, the scale does have a role, yes, I think. And as, as well as that is not a punctured <coughs> window, meaning it's not completely surrounded by brick. So I think the um, difference with secret leverance in the comparison to the window is if you have a, a artwork hanging on your wall, you have white wall most of the time around. And in this case, it goes, it stretches up to the concrete. So it's not just mm -hmm. a, a element hanging like a painting is. So it's, it's more of a subdivision of the whole wall Thus, it does not uh, have the same appearance like a painting. Also, you can see the thickness of the wall behind it or something like that, something like a kind of maybe structural frame, you know, that white uh, well, structure behind the glass. Uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, I think you are all right that uh, is the scale of it's a different, different scale, a different window, much larger, and also. But I also think probably it's a different kind of glass. Uh, the one in, in, in that Leverance used was more uh, uh, 
reflecting somehow than than this one. Yes, definitely. Now this I didn't quite understand the, the need for uh, playing with the beans in the way that uh, he did the, the ceiling beans. This yeah. One. Yeah. Yeah, in a way. That just seems a bit whimsical. It, it, yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Maybe it was some kind of commentary on, on Leverance, who has. But in the case of Leverance was uh, not just uh, graphic uh, or bi-dimensional, um, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, architectonic intervention, if there is such a thing by bi-dimensional, it shouldn't be. I, I don't think, I, from the little I know about Johan Chelsing, I don't think he's a superficial man at all. He must have had some reason this is something worth uh, uh, perhaps uh, investigating, looking at are, the- are there, are there windows on the other wall where these beams land? So it could be that he's spacing the beams so that there are no beams landing immediately above a window. That, that yes, of course, that, that could be a reason. No, he's a, he's a very rigorous uh, uh, architect, so I, I'm sure he had his uh, reasons for doing this. Yeah. I think he's just having fun. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> I don't know. He's, he, I don't know. He is not the, the, the kind of man to have too much fun. You'll see now his other work, the new crematorium in Stockholm in the Woodland Cemetery. Um, hey Dan, this is Bruce. How, how you doing? Hi Bruce. How you feeling? Uh, <laughs> I think I, I, uh, I uh, now the whole world knows that the spider took a bite. I, I think I, I, I had a love encounter with a with a spider. And uh, oh, that's great. So you're getting better. Well, not necessarily. Actually, I think it will. I, I will be. Uh, this will last for a long time. I see it doesn't go away, but I, I, I don't know. I saw the I saw the the spider last night, and then I had the idea this must have been it. Anyway, so look at the look at the, this crematorium. You know, it's it's uh, some people would say, well, it's not uh, it's, it's it's depressing. I mean, look, it's it's. Uh, it's not beautifying anything, but I, it's a very contemporary architectural work. It's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, 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 uh, it tells us that this is about the afterlife, and it doesn't try to give us illusions, you know, too many illusions, uh, especially towards the outside, you see. Uh, I like the fact that it, it, it is unfinished in, in the sense that it doesn't use finishing. You know, it's, it's uh, because it doesn't it doesn't want to 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 to, to lie in a way. You know, uh, the the roughness of the end of the life uh, maybe deserves uh, you know uh, the absence of too many illusions. Although inside uh, the, there is a you know level of um, uh, you know. You know, uh, you could say uh, it's a civilized, if we can call it so, civilized interior. Um, I like it more. It's, well, it's, it's, sol it's solemn, though. It's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's solemn. It's not uh, playful. It's solemn, yes. The word yeah. solemn should be used. But towards the outside is something a little bit less. I think it shows, um, you know, the, the stark reality of, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, 
the end of life. I don't know about this round uh, column anyway. This is the plan of the building, but when you look it from above, you'll see that there is, uh, I mean, even the elevation uh, is not as uh, without surprise as, as the plan might, might uh, you know, suggest. Yeah, and it is really very close to, to the works by Gunnar Asplund and uh, Sigurd Leverenz. Uh, so quite an honor to, to, to be in the vicinity of uh, two great uh, predecessors. Interesting, those windows towards the sky. It, it is, this is indeed the fifth elevation. The roof is, uh, you know, almost literally a fifth elevation or facade. And seen from here, it tells you, well, we are looking upwards to communicate with, with the creator. In some ways, like a burial mound. Yes. But look at the, look at the elevation, you know, uh, and, you know, I, I, I actually admire the fact that, you know, you can see the, you know, the, almost the process of becoming of the building and this, uh, you would say this is an, is not a finished building, but it is. Okay, so now, uh, uh, now I'll start the, the, the presentation uh, dedicated uh, to Zikur Leverence and just to him. And so we'll, we'll say happy birthday to him, slideshow from the beginning. Um, okay. Uh, Okay, Zigur Labarets. Actually, uh, I thought of reading, uh, but it's not very pleasant perhaps to read. Uh, it's a short text on Wikipedia about him, but you can read yourself uh, yourselves if you, if you are interested in, in him and, and, and his life. Um, in main, this is what it is. He studied first engineering, mechanical engineering, and then uh, some apprenticeship in Germany in architecture. Then he began to work with Gunnar Rasplund uh, and uh, opened his architecture office. Then he gave up architecture and opened a factory. Uh, and then for more than 10 years, that's what he did. And then he returned to architecture. This is the gentleman, uh, a serious uh, man, obviously. This one we saw. This one we saw, this one we didn't, but we see now. I think he was capable of some humor as well. And uh, yes, a uh, thinker, no doubt. Some drawings, uh, unfortunately I didn't find uh, too many, but there are two books, two, uh, the, the Japanese um, uh, publication, A plus U, Architecture and Urbanism, were dedicated to his drawings. So uh, apparently there is a great archive with his drawings. Uh, this is a, the early competition entry for, uh, uh, for the Woodland Cemetery. Interesting the way it is drawn, almost like a naive man, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, but, but I like this fact that is so, uh, you know, minimal and, 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 you know, lyrical in a naive way. I, 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 I like it. Of course, with such a drawing, you'd fail an exam in school, but uh, Zikur Leverance didn't care about that too much because he was not in school. So we saw this building, we saw this chapel, and now we see a section through that, 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 that building that didn't have windows. And the tension between the, the, the entrance, which is uh, historicist, and then, then the building itself, 
or the main part of the building, which is um, a crypt, essentially. Uh, other drawings. And now this is more, <laughs> it's a different kind of, uh, this is obviously not for a cemetery, it's for an exhibition. Uh, he worked also with Gunnar Rasplund for a, a Swedish, Swedish pavilion for an exhibition. I forgot in what year and where. Uh, it seems he was also concerned with fashion, or I don't know. Uh, anyway, these were drawings done for, uh, for, uh, for a competition. And here he worked with, uh, with, uh, with Gunnar Rasplund. But there is this element of, uh, of you know, uh, some kind of childishness in a way, which I like. Um, then you see, he also had several partners, like you see here, Leverence or Stubelius, or Stubelius, um, a house that is not uh, removed from the folk uh, traditions uh, of, of his, or the vernacular traditions of his country. Now, this is a, a, a building, uh, unfortunately, I should have translated it in Swedish and I do not know Swedish. Uh, it's uh, the earliest building by him from 1912. And it still uh, stands the, the passage of time, I think. Uh, it's maybe it's nothing exceptional, but uh, you know, it, it's not uh, an insult to, to, the, to the landscape at all. And I like, Personally, I, I like this austerity of the inside where there is a real wood, uh, you know. Uh, the aesthetics of, of Sweden are, are uh, and not just Sweden, the Scandinavian countries, as you know, Denmark had great designers and working greatly with, uh, with wood. Uh, and uh, Finland, of course, and uh, Sweden, Ah, by the way of Sweden, an architect who actually worked for Johan Chelsing told me that in Sweden, there isn't at all this cult of the personality in architecture. No, he, she said that even, uh, uh, um, you know, famous architects are very, very humble. A society doesn't uh, glorify them, doesn't place them on a pedestal, doesn't consider they are heroes, they are builders. And they try to build as well as they can, but so there is no, there is no, uh, you know, there isn't the mythology of the of the great architect at all. Of course, they respect, you know, these names Gunnar Asplund, uh, Sigurd Leverance, but within some limits. And maybe the whole world could uh, think a little bit about this. Is, this is, is that is that a general cultural trait that they don't uh, create these uh, celebrities, or is it just with regard to architecture? Um, well, I, it's a good question. I, I don't know because they had, as you know, <clears throat> famous. I think it is kind of a general uh, uh, mentality. Uh, but they also have great actors and great tennis players and, uh, you know, they have also... Right, but, but all of those individuals were celebrities in the world at large. And I just wonder if they had any special treatment within their own country. Uh, I don't think they did, from what I understood. Uh, uh, and, and, and I like this fact, you know, that mm. it's not a culture to, to, to promote superstars. And mm. um, I went twice to Sweden, and I, I, I confess, I, I, I felt there was a very, it was a very special country. It's very different from from uh, from Denmark, for example, and uh, Norway. I do not know. Also, very different from Finland. Maybe things can be explained also because of religion, because of their history. They were very poor until the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and so now it's a, it's a very rich country, but they were very poor, the Swedes. Many immigrated to the United States uh, and with great efforts. There are films about this that, uh, you know, there were immigrants from Sweden trying to escape poverty. So maybe they, because they knew also the other side of life, uh, 
Uh, although I've heard that now very rich people in uh, Sweden also indulge in the expensive cars and so on. But mm -hmm. what I felt when I was there for a few days, a sense of reticence, which I admire very much in the train, for example, you know, uh, almost everybody was reading a book and, and they were very quiet and uh, they, they were kind, you know, at times, you know, they would, if you look at them, they would look back and, you know, maybe smile, but very discreetly. It's a very, very civilized uh, country. I think uh, I was coming into Malmö from uh, Chicago, and I can tell you in Malmö, I felt provincial there. They have a so-called news town there, which when I visited it, I don't know, 20 years ago, uh, made me feel I was a primitive. I mean, the level of sophistication, the, I mean, I, I, I could talk the whole evening about it, not only because they built that the twisted tower by Calatrava, which I, we are going to see later, but also the, the blocks of flats and the people who were, you know, uh, uh, at the beach, and uh, there was a sense of, uh, of, um, of um, um, great sophistication. And at the same time, uh, um, I don't know, I, I saw somebody raising the hand, please, you don't need to raise the hand, please, uh, please uh, come in with your comments if you want to. But I don't know what to do. Uh, <laughs> somebody raised a hand and I said there is no reason to raise a hand. I mean, um, uh, what should I do? I move on, but again, if any of you would like to say something, please do so without, uh, there is no need for me to uh, stop sharing the screen and then click on the, I don't know, it's a procedure which intimidates me. So I would rather not do it. But I look again at this, at this interior, but what do I see? You know, I see wood, I see benches. Also interesting benches is a sense of community. You now a bench is for several people and these long, rather long tables. And I, I think it does express something about the country. You know, this is a country that, that values communality and this, in a way, a simple way of life. I also heard that is a country where the woman is the center, the center, <clears throat> the central part of the of the country, and not the man. <clears throat> this is also the <clears throat> the country. I'm sorry, where the prime minister goes to to the parliament on bicycle. Can you imagine something like this in other countries? I mean, I have the highest admiration for such a country where the prime minister goes to work on bike. Well, unfortunately, uh, about 20 years ago, she was killed because she was uh, shopping in a, another, another prime minister was, was killed in a supermarket because she was shopping like everyone else with the plastic bags and was killed by uh, an immigrant uh, on an escalator. So tragedies do happen. Anyway, this is a villa, uh, uh, but I couldn't find pictures of her. I'm sorry, from 1912, so she was very young. Then another one, I hope for this one I have. I have at least a plan, but um, I don't know if I have a picture. Maybe I, I, I use the Swedish um, um, Wikipedia, hoping to find more materials, but uh, I, I, I didn't find as much as I would have liked. Here you can see something, but not, uh, you know, not sufficiently, uh, not sufficient. Um, then another villa from 1914. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, these, are, these, these are, I don't know if Florian talked about this, these apartment buildings or blocks of flats. Um, if we can call them blocks of flats. I mean, they are, but, you know, we just, you know, two, two levels. They remind me more of British uh, housing complexes than um, um, something else. He was very young at that time, but look at this uh, staircase, you know, is, is, uh, is, is, 
is architecture. Is architecture done with the simplest means? You have a handrail, you have the two walls, and you have the stair and the ceiling, and that's it. But it's both simple and complex at the same time. The flower shop. <clears throat> now, this is a masterpiece by him. I learned that I read that many uh, students of architecture and architects come from all over the world to see this building. It's a small building and, and we could very well ask ourselves, how come that this, uh, you know, almost insignificant building attracts so much attention? Uh, this is the building. You say, well, you know, we yeah, so what's so special here? Well, <laughs> let's try to answer this question. What's it's the so building special about talking this about. building? What do you think? What is your first reaction? What, uh, I'll show more pictures and then maybe come back. It's a flower shop. It's a, you know, uh, it has a clear function. It's, uh, it's not, maybe this because it's not, it doesn't have a, you know, the usual sweetness of a flower shop. It's actually stern, uh, but uh, appropriately so, because it is part of a cemetery. And you see here, the windows are also large, like in the case of uh, Johann Jensen. But again, they, they give a different, uh, because the way they, the glass is connected to the, to the concrete wall, I guess this is one of the reasons. Um, they do give that feeling that uh, Mahab, Mahadev uh, uh, correctly identified as, uh, you know, as if a picture is, is, uh, is uh, hanged on the wall on the outside. But it is a very convincing so-called modern gesture. Just those two windows, you know, save, they save the, the, the concrete uh, box from banality, you know, because if you remove them uh, or, or maybe do them differently, the building would be less, um, uh, less interesting. Now on the back is what you see, I have other pictures with a building on the back. Um, here, in some cases, you, you do see the flowers. Hey, I don't know, is it, is it just because it was made by him that the building became uh, a destination for the cultural tourists? What do you think? Because sometimes this could happen, you know, may, maybe you have a building that is not uh, brilliant by a brilliant architect. And because it was done by that architect, uh, it becomes, uh, maybe a little more than uh, what it actually is. And if it was built by someone less known, um, although you'll see indoor some very interesting things. So this is not a, a banal building, but it could have been a banal building and it's not. I like the way he plays with these bulbs, these electrical um, sources of light. And look here. I think this is brilliant. So you create ornamentation with the most basic function, you know, with uh, pipes, with, you know, with, you know, the most, you know, prosaic parts of, 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 of construction. But because of the playfulness, they become architecture and they serve architecture. And I think this is excellent. And also here you see a different arrangement. So I think- yeah. I, I have never seen that before. That's really very clever. I think it is, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Why, why, why should they all be straight and, you know, I mean, you can create a very interesting graphic work or, or calligraphy uh, with, uh, with, 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 this, with this sort of uh, things that otherwise, you know, are uh, hidden within the thickness of the world. I think this is definitely the catch of the flower shop where okay. he as a mechanical electrical engineer is, uh, is doing something like this. 
I mean, the rest is a bit too ordinary for my taste, but they're proportionally nice. The building, I mean. Yeah. Um, but when I look at this facade, what do I see? I see a, a concrete uh, box. I see a door, which is uh, not claiming to be anything else and is not even uh, uh, attempting to seduce you in any way with its uh, particular beauty is rather, you know, pedestrian. And then you have this, yes, this uh, unusual uh, windows or picture windows or how to call them. And that's it. And then you have the shadings resulting from the, you know, the weathering of the concrete, which that didn't seem to bother the architect. And uh, that's fine. I think, uh, uh, yeah, architecture can be done with simple means that is not, uh, it appears to be ordinary, but, but there is a sense of aesthetical, um, or maybe I'm just projecting some kind of um, wishful thinking. I don't know. I wonder if I didn't know that this was by Zigur Leverance, if I would have, I don't know, but because of those windows and, and when I think more, when I look more at the, the facade, you know, it, 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 it's almost uh, uh, anti-beauty, almost anti-aesthetics. And this in itself is some kind of a so-called avant-garde gesture. Uh, or this bus, bus station, I think, uh, or I don't know what it is, maybe just a, um, you know, maybe it's not a bus station. I don't know what it is. I couldn't translate. Uh, maybe it's um, <coughs> just a, a place to, you know, to find some kind of, uh, <laughs> in case it rains, you know, like, uh, uh, I, I don't know, it's part of the cemetery. And here you have some, some historicist elements, but very discreet. And this is a, 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 a another kind of chapel. It is a little bit uh, confusing me here now because he does use sometimes. Now these were built over the years, not all at the same time. But in some cases, he does use historicist uh, elements like the columns here. The bell tower, which is very nice, uh, the bell tower, uh, and it's also very nice because it's uh, within a nature that is not, uh, you know, suffocated by the human uh, uh, intervention. Uh, and uh, yeah, that cross there maybe is a little too obvious, but you know, the the bell tower otherwise is 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 an, an interesting addition so to speak, to, to, uh, to the natural landscape. He's considered a functional, functionalist architect. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, we can use the word functionalist in, in, in various ways. Um, it could be a little bit misleading and in other ways it could be correct. Yeah. So he built all of this, the entry, the chapel of St. Birgitta and uh, St. Gertrude and St. Saint, Saint Nut. Uh, later, 20 years later, almost the bell tower that you saw, the flower shop that you saw. So now we'll see the other, the, 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 the chapel. We saw it already, but we'll, we'll see more pictures. And the two uh, twin uh, uh, chapels for St. Gertrude and St. Nut. This is the chapel for St. Birgitta. I guess that those historicist elements were uh, at the beginning of his career and when he was still uh, kind of rooted in, uh, you know, some kind of uh, historicism. That's, um, I don't know about this. <laughs> those floor, I mean, they are so uh, solemnly uh, placed there, but maybe that's not what we need all this huge large space in front of it but but again i think he's a master of, uh, of handling the skin of the building uh, which is not a facade in the sense of a potemkin facade is not hiding 
although here, you know, what is behind it, you don't quite know. But it's still, even this fragment tells you I am, uh, I am the work of an architect. And yes, the entrance uh, through the, I guess he did his entrance, you know, this, uh, those two trees that meet at the top. So uh, it's, it's, it's very, very nice. You don't need anything else. When I first visited Paris, and it was kind of late in my life, you know, I went for the first time in my in, in, to Paris when I was uh, uh, forty something, and uh, I remember I went straight to the Louvre, and I was, I love earth and I love even dust, but I was so uh, you know uh, surprised to see that. You know, at, uh, the, the gardens of Tuileries, that's how it is. They don't have, uh, you know, uh, you, you have, uh, you know, earth. And um, I was coming to New York and uh, I had the idea to write a book called uh, Paris La Plus Mediocre Ville du Monde. <laughs> and uh, maybe it's a good thing I didn't write, write it. But I don't think it was because of the fact that they didn't, in fact, I think it was a good thing they didn't asphalt their pathways in the gardens of Tuileries. This is, a, I think it's a great, great picture. You know, uh, that, 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 that cluster, that agglomeration of, of trees that, that announce you that something is going to happen there. They were planted with an intention, otherwise the landscape is so pure, the sky and the hill, and it, it, it's just perfect because there is no design with the exception of, you know, having that grouping of, 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 of the trees there. I love this speech. Now, the, the two chapels that are uh, like almost twin, twin chapels, and uh, uh, this particular one for uh, Saint, Saint Knut, uh, the canopy got uh, damaged and Johann Chelsing was in charge to, to, to do the work. And if you open the website of Johann Chelsing, you'll see more details about, uh, you know, uh, his rigorous restoring of the, of the canopy that uh, was used by uh, Sigurd Leverenz in this uh, building. So here you see the two, the two uh, chapels, uh, St. Birgitta, uh, I guess Brigitte, Birgitta, and then uh, St. Knut here. Now, the Woodland Cemetery, which we saw already some pictures of with his contribution there. Uh, we didn't see this one. It's not very clear to me <laughs> what is happening there. Are there really huge uh, stones? Uh, it almost looks like a, a, a wall covering with huge stones uh, using a more primitive technique than the one used by, by uh, the people who built uh, Machu, Machu Picchu. Um, anyway, the Chapel of Resurrection, which you saw, also uh, in uh, Stockholm at uh, Woodland Cemetery, This is the drawing, the original drawing, um, done of course manually. Very simple, no, and not too many notations, not uh, no dimensions. No. Now, a work that is uh, is considered important in his oeuvre, uh, Malmö Opera House, built before the war, is. You know, maybe not so spectacular. It's a modern building, uh, you know, as you would expect from some architects. Maybe, maybe not built so early, but um, so this is the building. So it was built during the 11 years until the end of the war. 
and it still functions. It's still uh, a building that uh, works well in our time. But its aesthetics uh, are kind of uh, identifiable. Uh, I mean, the timing, the, the time when it was built, uh, didn't, uh, the passage of time somehow uh, uh, was less gentle because it's, it's kind of clear when this was built. Anyway, Malmö is, uh, is, uh, is still proud of this building. He worked here with two other architects and in some other works he also, he didn't work alone really. Um, but in, particularly in this for such a big uh, project, uh, the team was larger. I think the railing somehow brings something uh celebratory, um, but not too much, something a bit feminine inside, like embroidery a bit. Yes, 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 they, they, they do show a certain femininity, yes. You wouldn't uh, expect to find in a almost uh, international style building, but yes, a good observation, Daliana, thank you. Okay, now, uh, I'm sorry, this. Uh, uh, I don't like, I don't like phones and they don't like me. Uh, I, I had to, anyway, two churches. Um, he built these two churches later in his life and uh, they are, they are uh, very special. I think uh, they are, probably his greatest works. So <clears throat> after over a decade of absence from architecture, Sigurd Leverenz reappeared with the creation of St. Mark's Church in uh, Berghagen in Stockholm. His winning design for the church brought him back to the art of building and his apt control of materiality brought the St. Mark's Church international attention. Leverenz received the commission for St. Mark's Church through a competition. He was invited along with four other architects to propose ideas for the new church. Leveren submitted multiple ideas and was ultimately chosen as the designer for the new church in 1956. St. Mark's Church is located in a suburb of Stockholm, uh, Sweden. <clears throat> the two buildings on the site are set amongst a grove of birch trees with little connection to the surrounding, I guess, suburbs. Anyway, this is the church, and uh, and uh, yeah, it is a it is a good building. So it was built in 1956 or late 50s. <clears throat> so it's <clears throat> almost <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> like 60 years old. Uh, it would be <clears throat> it would be interesting to compare this church by Leverence with uh, churches built by uh, Le Corbusier and, uh, and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright about the same time. I'm talking about, um, you know, uh, church uh, right built in Florida and um, even a synagogue around that time. And also uh, the conceived, Le Corbusier conceived Saint Pierre de Firmini Vert, but it was built later after his death, after 1965. Uh, I think what I see here in, in Leverence case, uh, and not just him, the Scandinavian architecture, very, very sensitive to, to, to nature uh, and usually modest in, uh, in, uh, in terms of dimensions. Although Denmark has some, uh, uh, some buildings that are less modest uh, in terms of ecclesiastical architecture. But, you know, Sweden, uh, and also it would be interesting to compare with some churches built by Alvar Alto. Uh, 
anyway, it's a, it's an interesting subject, and I have maybe one day we'll talk more about um, um, you know um, so-called sacred architecture from uh, other parts of the world, including Germany and including Switzer Switzerland. There are beautiful examples of post-war um, um, church architecture in uh, in um, particularly in Germany and uh, Switzerland, and also a little bit in Austria. But the Scandinavian countries also, where you see here, this is what I like, it's not, the Scandinavian man is not at war with nature. Is uh, at least this is what I see in this building. Leverance is telling me, is telling us, you know, uh, is a reflection, is, is a meditation on, on, on life, through bricks and uh, you know architectonic spaces uh, he's not trying to assert a man beyond uh, you know the obvious limits and I, I, I admire this Like he has all kinds of inventions here, you know, he's, he's not, uh, he's, uh, he continues to explore uh, and his architectural language is uh, sometimes surprising, you know, like here, you almost see some oriental influence in a way, you know, look at the, uh, the columns and the transition from the column to the canopy, uh, um, to the roofing. Um, it's almost like in an oriental temple in a certain sense. So, well, actually, this belongs, uh, I'm sorry, this was a mistake. These pictures belong to the second church that I'm going to, to, to show. Um, St. Peter. If you look at the ceiling here uh, in the section, and then uh, we, we contemplate the pictures, it's, it's very interesting. You wouldn't expect, you know, there are variations. In fact, it might be that this, now that I look more carefully uh, without, I'm not trying to blame the, 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 the spider for my uh, lack of attention, but it doesn't seem to be the same building because I see here the ceiling indeed, it has this, uh, um, this geometrized uh, uh, waving uh, uh, or waves, but much, much more irregular here than what is then the drawing. Although the drawing was named as being a section through this building, but I don't think it is. Sometimes the information on the web is, uh, is uh, deficient. Um, I thought that uh, Johann Chelsing, uh, his whimsical uh, handling of the roofing was also some kind of oblique uh, reference to, to uh, Zigur Leverance in this building. Um, the building is, is kind of dark, but I think a church, uh, I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Um, no, that section is correct, but it's looking, you see, it's interesting, it's looking towards the, uh, towards the left, the wall on the left, and not to, towards on the right. So it is correct. Uh, this is a section, longitudinal section through the church, but looking towards the other, the other wall, meaning, uh, so it's kind of interesting. Here you have a ceiling that is, uh, when it reaches uh, the parallel walls, the opposite walls, it becomes different. I wonder why he did so. 
but it's uh, it's uh, it's interesting. I think the Swedes, maybe I'm wrong, but I think they are not obsessed, but I think they are um, very concerned with death because I read that uh, in, in Sweden, when someone becomes uh, 60 years old, begins to do what is called uh, death cleaning. In other words, they begin to get rid of things because they know the end is approaching, although you know they have long lives. So they could live other 30 years or so, but uh, they don't want to create uh, problems for uh, you know their children and so on. So they begin to to empty, you know, uh, to get rid of their belongings. Um, I don't know if this is a habit in Scandinavian countries, but that's what I read about Sweden. Desk cleaning. I love this detail, you know, to 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 bring the water uh, out outside of the world. So with very, with very simple means in a way, uh, uh, you create architecture out of the most uh, you know, banal function. And I, I, I love the prequel, I, I love the metallic part, which is, uh, uh, is done just as it should be done, uh, no more, no less, but it becomes, I don't know, it, it attracts my attention, aesthetical attention. Of course, many people would say, well, please, would you please finish up this world? Don't leave it like this, you know, don't, don't you see how it looks like, you know, it's, it's not pretty. Yes, it's not pretty, but he didn't want to make it pretty. I mean, a pretty church is, uh, <laughs> is something worth talking about, you know, if it's, I mean, you know, should we, should we build pretty churches? Um, on the other hand, I don't think it is a self-indulgence in, uh, in, uh, in morbidity. I, 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 I don't think so. Well, maybe a little bit. I, I don't know. Now you see here how interesting is with this. In fact, at first I had a feeling that this is some kind of a Trump play. And uh, again, I feel tempted to, to blame the spider, but uh, uh, it's not the spider. It's now I'm beginning to see better. At first, I had the feeling that there are um, uh, uh, the, the same windows, uh, picture windows that he used, and there are reflections on them. But now I see that it's actually something else. But what could be those narrow, you know, almost walls, a wall with a picture window in it, but there is no inner space. What do you think it is there? A skylight. Pardon? A skylight. I don't know, but you see it's so narrow. The, if it is a skylight, it, you know, it doesn't, it almost doesn't seem to have a, 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 an inner space. Yeah, but maybe underneath. Well, yes, yes, yes. But yes. still, in order to yes. bring the light into the space underneath, you need to have some spacing there for the light to go through in the space yes. underneath. And if there yes. is, it's very yes. narrow. It would, just, it would just be a slot in the ceiling. I think it is a kind of... Hmm. What is also interesting is in the front part of these four skylights, the alternating uh, brick pattern. Yeah. Vertical line of the mortar and then the shifted and then again the vertical line and then the shifted point. It's very, uh, yeah, intentional, of course. It's you know a way I mean? of saying it's not a structural uh, wall and maybe like uh, the other cases. No, um, uh, about which wall are you talking about? Um, about the wall with the, the, the window, as uh, Florian said, uh, it's treated differently than, uh, I mean, the brick course is treated differently. And maybe mm. it's a suggestion that it's not uh, the thickness of a wall. I don't know. 
that it has this empty void in it to allow light to pass. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, it, has a, it also has a groove. The other one doesn't have a groove. No, there are two like these. And yeah, exactly. Two, like, yeah. Of the other groove. kind. Anyway, I, I don't know if I have the plan and the detail. It would be interesting to, to study. But, but again, I think what I see here is, is the chance to, uh, to imagine that doesn't matter what building you are building, doesn't matter the budget you are having, you can be very creative and very inventive. And, uh, and uh, I, I think it's true. St. Peter's Church in Klipan, uh, uh, this is also has, uh, you saw already some, some images from it. This is his light, last work. The Church of St. Peter in Klipan <clears throat> is the last major work of the Swedish architect Sigurd Leverenz and embodies a holistic and obsessive architectural vision. The church manages to sit independent of style and tradition, quietly questioning and subverting a multitude of architectural and constructional, constructional, constructional norms to form a deeply imaginative and particular building. Uh, the, the, there are several buildings actually here and rather modest in terms of scale. Uh, and uh, you saw some pictures and even some details already. I like the, I like the way he handles the structure very much, you know, he, there is metal work here and uh, then then you have the roofing which is uh, complex uh, it, it's it's creation it's architectural creation what can we say plus this this it's is specifically like a in a church uh, yeah the cross with the top chopped off that is, that is kind of a bit weird is it not right right i'm sure it was done uh, intentionally so and um, mm. You know, uh, yeah. So this is an interesting idea, you know, in a church to 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 use to 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 the, the cross, the cross to become also a structure in a certain part in the building. You could almost say that this this uh, T element is actually an image not of the cross Christ was uh, crucified on, but of Christ himself. Because, you know, the two arms and the vertical line represents the body. And yes, the head is not there, but uh, maybe it's that square between the two arms. I kind of see... Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, Anthropos there, there's a human mm. being holding but the church. But sometimes crosses are depicted without the head piece, without the vertical piece about the um, beam, the horizontal beam. They're just T's in some depictions. Mm. Ah, here we see a section through those uh, <laughs> those walls. Indeed, they are they are skylights. Uh, yes, unusual skylights, considering that they are very, you know, they just bring light, almost uh, as, as lines of light. He also works with the floor. The, the tiles uh, sometimes have um, the various kinds of, um, you know, uh, geometrical uh, configuration. But 
in general, he uses a very simple, uh, well, the, what I'm trying to say is uh, the decorative side of his architecture is not overwhelming, uh, you know, the structural side. There is a balance. It is very discreet, actually. If there is ornamentation, it is discreet. And it is connected with, um, with um, you know, with masonry, with structure. But I really like these this, uh, windows, these picture windows, because, you know, they continuously uh, um, change and, uh, you know, they, it's in a way uh, a, a, an image about the floating, uh, the fleeting, the fleeting world. Uh, we are all part of this fleeting world and uh, we don't know for how long. So you have the solidity of the masonry world. Uh, you have the eternal and the immutable, and then you have the, the ephemeral, the transitory, the circumstantial that uh, Baudelaire talked about, represented by the reflections on these, uh, uh, on these uh, you know, mirrors, uh, mirrors of the outer world, and mirrors also of ourselves in a way. You know, uh, it, it is as if they, they are telling me, you know, uh, uh, reflect on your on your own uh, vulnerability. And uh, yes, the world behind this is, uh, is is the world beyond. But but you are part of this uh, ephemeral world. We have seen this um, this picture. and the differential uh, lamps. Does he work with similar size of bricks or uh, is he experimenting also on the format of the uh, bricks? I mean, the, the dimension. Well, I, I, I think him many times he seems to work with kind of a, you know, but I, I saw a few, a few uh, cases where he uses some other bricks, but not like uh, Alvar Alto in that experimental house where he used, uh, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 kinds of bricks, but there was just uh, an experimental house. Uh, he, no, I think he, he, I think he uses, you know, standard bricks from what I see. We have seen this, and I, I, I truly think this is uh, like that electrical work on in the flower shop. This is um, also, um, you know, uh, high point in his uh, architectural work. Here he seems to use different kinds of bricks. And look at the poetry of this. Here you have, uh, of course, it's a fragment of a larger picture and you'll see the whole picture. But do we need more than this really? I mean, here you have geometry, here you have the, the masonry, and um, in this case, three different kinds of bricks. But you also have, uh, it's a plastic work. It's, it's, it's uh, I mean, the, this photograph, just this fragment is, 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 is uh, appealing uh, aesthetically. And what it is, is actually this. And uh, you see, I think this answers your question, uh, Daliana, he does use uh, various kinds of bricks, um, at least in this case, and he does it very well. Um, because sometimes perhaps it's not so easy to combine uh, in a convincing way, various kinds of uh, the same material or various kinds of bricks. I have a feeling uh, Frampton would, would love this building or loves it because really this is about tectonics. You know, this is not a building that is uh, finding refuge or trying to find refuge in, uh, 
polished uh, lies. No, this is about this is about the art of building, and I intentionally said the art of building. It's building, but building that became art. He's a builder here, but he's also an architect because he brings a new dimension to the act of building. Um, I, I don't know about this style work here. It seems a little busy compared to what we saw before. I'm not even sure is, if he's in the same. Uh, you will see the next two or three pictures are about some tile work by him, not necessarily from this church. Um, Well, <laughs> I could have called them differently. Uh, here they are. Also, they are shadows on the on the wall. You know. Um, I think this is the last picture of this uh, presentation. And now, if you allow me, maybe just to compare him with Gunnar Asplund, because. If we are now talking about, uh, we talked about Zigur Leverenz, perhaps it is worth also knowing the work of Gunnar Asplund, because they are probably the, the two most important Swedish architects. I always thought that Gunnar Asplund was a little bit a better architect. Uh, he died younger, he died at 55. Uh, Zigur Leverenz died at 90. Uh, so, Quickly, I will make up a presentation, if you allow me to, on Gunnar Asplund, and then we'll have a better understanding, I think, of where, um, you know, to situate um, uh, Sigur Leverenz. I think uh, Gunnar Asplund, um, uh, he is well, better known in a way, but uh, maybe also because Alvar Aalto was influenced by, uh, by, uh, by Gunnar Asplund, and uh, we'll see now uh, what he did. If you arrive in Stockholm, uh, his works, uh, they are uh, formidable. It's the Woodland Cemetery first, or not, maybe not first, the uh, Stockholm National Library, the uh, Stockholm Public Library, which is the temple of books. And if there is ever a, a temple of books that I saw in my life, it was this library. And uh, uh, he has also a, semi, a cinema. This is the this is Gunnar Asplund. Too bad he died at fifty five, but he did something in uh, in his um, not so long life. Uh, you can tell the Swedes are introverted and they are they are uh, you know they, they are sensitive but they are intense. They are volcanoes. Uh, you know, it is it is it is said that usually the Latins are volcanoes and the people in the north are not, but they are they are hidden volcanoes. I, I remember reading that Tadao Ando said that he wanted to be like a Piranesi inside and like a Joseph Albers outside, <clears throat> meaning a tumultuous. I'm sorry, a tumultuous nature within, uh, like Piranesi, Carceri, or whatever, and then outside the Apollonic uh, paintings of the Bauhaus artist Joseph Albers. Here is something else, but I do believe uh, the Swedes uh, have an intense inner life. Uh, here he is with, uh, <laughs> with his um, office, in his office. Uh, only man, of course, things changed since then. Um, it is almost narrower than uh, the office, uh, the Atelier of Le Corbusier in Rue de Sèvres in Paris. <clears throat> I guess it's his apartment, or anyway, it looks like an apartment. Uh, he has a little bit more of a space than, than the, the people in his, uh, in his office. And uh, yeah, I think he, he was one of the most important modern architects in the 20th century. 
uh, worldwide actually. And as I said, <clears throat> Alvar Aalto admired him very much and uh, I'm sure not just him. So the Woodland Cemetery, we, I'll show things that you didn't see before. Uh, this is the plan I think he worked together with, uh, uh, with the Leverance on. And there are various buildings, a crematorium and uh, other things there. But there is a very striking image <clears throat> with a big cross <clears throat> emerging from the earth directly. We'll arrive there. Uh, please notice the, the handwriting, you know, the graphic uh, quality of the handwriting, which is almost, uh, you know, baroque. Uh, <clears throat> But the triangle uh, of, the, of the roofing of the building, and you see this chapel is, uh, is um, almost is primal. It's almost like archetypal. <clears throat> so I, right now I, I just show some drawings. This, I mean, when I was there and I saw this, I, I thought I, I arrived at the, you know, at the point zero, the zero point of architecture in a way, modern architecture, um, very powerful. And done with so-called the simplest means. So these buildings have been built by him. Uh, the solemnity that is probably uh, uh, unavoidable for such a function uh, is present. <clears throat> I think uh, this deep respect for, for, for death and reverence um, is, uh, is something, uh, you know, uh, I personally admire. So <clears throat> a touch of historicism here. Um, but this chapel is also interesting uh, beyond the, you know, the particular um, historicists that he used. This one maybe was built earlier and uh, in conjunction uh, with, uh, with the Leverance. And that uh, crematorium that uh, Johann Chelsing built is not far away from this building and the other two that you saw before. So this is the inside of that uh, chapel. This is the crematorium. And uh, there are other buildings that are related to the, the function of, of, of the cemetery. And as you see, uh, the expression uh, is, is different. So <clears throat> this is Gunnar Asplund. For a portion of this work, he was held by uh, Sigurd Leverenz. Then I don't know for what reasons uh, Leverenz left. This one we saw, uh, I'm not insisting on it, is the crematorium that, that is in the proximity of these buildings. And I just thought it would be interesting to compare what is being done today to what was done then.
other projects and drawings, uh, some with a questionable resolution. He also did, also together with Leveren, some, some participation in competitions for the Swedish uh, pavilion, I don't know for what international uh, expo. This is, uh, yeah, please remember this drawing when we will arrive at the, at the public library, <clears throat> the temple of books, which is so famous. His houses, his villas are a little bit uh, bucolic uh, and a little bit whimsical. And, uh, and uh, I think that is also kind of the case with the Leverens. But he also imagined buildings, you know, in for the city itself, uh, either Stockholm or uh, Göteborg or some other cities. You will see a beautiful city hall built by him in Göteborg, truly beautiful. Um, a boat, a boat transformed into some kind of a house. Maybe for Mr. Ingels from Big, who lives on a boat or on a ship. Um, furniture, this I didn't see, uh, you know, Leverance apparently didn't design, uh, you know, chairs. Gunnar Asplund did. Again, that's, you know, it, it does seem to it does seem to have a certain uh, role in, in, in this society, in the Swedish society, death. Here again. This one we saw uh, built. Now, we arrive at this major work by him, a truly very, very important library. And some years ago, there was a very important international competition about adding uh, other buildings, uh, you know, to this existing one by, by uh, Gunnar Asplund. This is the Temple of Books. And when I was there, I felt just that, that it is the sad Temple of Books. You could say it's neoclassical, it is, uh, it is predictable. That's not the feeling I had when I arrived there. It's, yeah, it's, you know, you are not maybe surprised, but when you are inside, it, it, it is appropriate for the function it has and its symbolism is, is correct. Uh, so the books, all that cylinder is populated with, with books all around the inner walls. So you have uh, the books in a way making the transition between uh, you know uh, the, the profane world and you know what is above, let's say knowledge or wisdom or awareness, and this is the, there are some pictures inside. Uh, people are very nice there. I remember I asked a librarian about how to see. I don't know what other building by him, and he almost came with with me, and uh, I was with a student who we both were searching for ways to find a building by another building by him. And the librarian almost put his coat on. Uh, it was a little bit uh, cold outside to come with us to, to show us uh, that other building. Very, very kind. So this is the temple of books. Um, in a surprising way, perhaps, uh, uh, the, 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 the men I met in Sweden are, are uh, uh, rather feminine and uh, yeah, and the women are more assertive and, uh, and very, very, uh, you know, strong. It's a very fine building. Uh, and you'll see also some entries from the competition that I mentioned with uh, uh, an addition. It was a large competition. Unfortunately, they didn't build the winning uh, scheme. Uh, I said, fortunately, because I don't think they chose uh, in a very inspired way. They, they had some great uh, 
projects in their hands, but the committee that uh, evaluated uh, the projects uh, was, I guess, not very inspired. I can tell you a short story about this building. <clears throat> On Easter day, in uh, some years ago, I, I, for a certain reason, I traveled to, to Stockholm and uh, it was on Easter Sunday. So because I wanted to see this building again, I went to it and you see it's a hill uh, on the left. I climbed on the hill because I wanted to see the building from above. And I was passing by, there was no one, no one. It was Sunday Easter. And it was just me and a man on a bench talking on the phone, on the mobile phone. And he, I couldn't believe my ears. He said to the one he was talking to, I told you what ingredients to use for the bomb. Please don't try to change anything. Do it as I told you. And I, I passed by the, the, the bench. I, I still I didn't believe I've heard correctly. But it, this was actually uh, around the time when the war in Iraq started, maybe a few years later, but not much later, one or two years later. So there was a, a, a talk about uh, terrorism and uh, I became concerned and after a while I said, <clears throat> maybe I should, I should talk with the police because this man talking on the, on the bench, you know, about how to manage, and he, he didn't seem to joke. Uh, I said, maybe something uh, could be related to, to indeed manufacturing a bomb. So it took me some while, I was not very spontaneous, it took me some, a while to uh, to, uh, to 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 leave the, the hill on the left side in this picture, and I searched for a, there was no police car, but I found a taxi uh, taxi, and I went to the driver and all the men, and I, I I explained to him what what brought him brought me to him, and he said, yeah, let, let's call the police. So he called the police, and uh, not very very quickly actually, it took them some time, like. 20 minutes, half an hour, uh, um, a nice car came with two beautiful uh, Scandinavians, two Swedes, uh, you know, the policemen, they came to me very polite and they asked me to tell them uh, what the story was. And then, because until I found the taxi, I had to walk a lot through the city. So I distanced myself from the hill, from the library by Asplund. We went back with his their car to this park and we climbed the hill and we went to that bench. In the meantime, there was no one there any longer. And uh, they knew I would, I would go back to Chicago. Uh, I mean, I told them that I was leaving the next day and they said, you know, in case something happens, would, would you be willing to uh, come back to Sweden and testify and so on? I said, sure, but I hope nothing will happen. They never contacted me, so uh, Stockholm is just fine, and uh, you know. Uh, but but that's what happened. Anyway, sorry. Um, move forward. This is the the section through the Temple of Books. It's quite powerful that that cylinder, and uh, both in plan and in section. And uh, you see, you can do with simple means a lot. You know, you have the circle and it has to be a circle because it's knowledge. It's, it's, it's the intermediate zone between man and, uh, you know, knowledge or, uh, you know, awareness or enlightenment, you name it. It's really the primal. So you have to have a luminous ceiling as well. Uh, well, yeah, and it has those windows you see at the top. Yeah. And it's painted white or... Uh... Yes. Um, but when you look at the facade, you know, the elevations, you say, well, you know, what's so special? This is the drawing of a kid almost, you know? But uh, it's not at all like this. It's, uh, you know, it's proportions and it's everything works very well. It, it does have power, the building. It might have inspired Michael Graves. Probably, yes.
this is how you enter the building uh, and then you know slowly you you realize the the vastness of the cylinder there are also you know ornamental elements uh, referring to i don't know uh, various uh, forms of writing or mythologies but they are very discreet It's not oppressive. It is a centralized building, but it's not oppressive at all. And of course, there are these beautiful uh, details. You know, this. Uh, I mean, it's a sink, but look at it. It's more than a sink. It's 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 almost like the, the you know, uh, it, it's a purification fountain. It's uh, it's almost a spiritual sink, if I can if I can say something like this. Uh, because it included also that uh, little sculpture there, and uh, you know the way it is supported uh, in a you know kind of a triangular structure, not bad. No, no, it, it's one of the great buildings of modern architecture, no doubt. And and the competition I mentioned attracted many many people even famous architects. I don't know why they, why they chose in such an uh, uninspired way. Uh, they really didn't choose. In fact, it made me, I mean, I don't want to sound uh, presumptuous or uh, anything, but uh, maybe you know that Frank Lloyd Wright declared that he, he will never take part in competitions because he's never going to be allowed to, be, to become the victim of a, of a mediocre committee. Well, in this case, it was a committee indeed that decided uh, the, the winning uh, project. And fortunately, uh, after a few years of reflection and maybe opposition from the public or architects, they decided not to build it. And I think it was a good decision. Although I have seen, in fact, I organized an exhibition in uh, Evanston, Chicago, with some of the entries. I knew some of these projects. They had some very good uh, proposals, but they didn't win. Now, this is a great building, I think. The courthouse, not the city called, sorry, the extension in Göteborg, or Göteborg, I imagine. Ah, sorry, uh, uh, there are two bu different buildings. This is also perfect, I think, in terms of modern architecture, situated in a, you know, a specific context where there is history, urban urban history i think he did a great job it's a modern building it's a modern addition look at this it's modest it's refined it's uh, it's su suggestive of its function a courthouse uh, so I, I i think he did a splendid job with again with with you know apparently simple means you look you look at the old building on the left and you look at his building on the right and uh, yes, you have tradition, but you also have innovation. You don't have just, you know, following up with your head lowered submissively what was behind uh, before you there. So in this picture, it's very clear. These two buildings that belong to the same function were built in different times. And on the right, you had a creative architect who, as, as the secessionists, of Vienna, very well put it, to, <clears throat> to every time, or uh, yeah, to every time, it's art and to art, it's freedom. So, of course, they, he couldn't build, you know, just to mimic a continuation, a servile con continuation of what was on the left. He asserted his time, but not without uh, some, some respect, uh, an obvious respect towards the building that preceded it. Very good. I, I think it's a, it's a, it's not harmony through contrast as you would have perhaps at the Jewish Museum by Lipskin in Berlin. Now th there is no violent contrast here. The inside is uh, also excellent. Um, I mean, look at this uh, staircase. You know. I don't know about that that clock, but the the, the staircase is is nice, <laughs> you know. By by the way of the clock, I I remember what the, the malicious, the eternally malicious 
Oscar Wilde said that, <clears throat> uh, you know, in the Renaissance, Italy had uh, poisonings and wars and killings and, uh, you know, the guillotine and so on. But they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael and so on. While he said the Swiss had peace for many centuries. And what did they produce? The, the cuckoo clock. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, right now, Swiss, Switzerland is also uh, giving uh, to the world of architecture at least a lot of uh, good and interesting architecture. But when I look at this clock, I actually hope that Gunnar Asplum can nothing to do with it. If you would remove that clock uh, or, or make a different uh, kind of clock, it would be better. But the, the staircase is exquisite. And, and everything is exquisite, you know, the, the doors and the, everything is, is fine. You know, it, it's, a, it's a dignified building uh, at the inside as well, but it's also warm. It is a warm building, it's not a cold building. And so I feel, I feel you feel protected inside this building. Uh, when was it completed, do you know? <sighs> to my shame, I don't. Uh, I think in the 30s, I think it was before the war. But, but to my shame, I do not know. Uh, I should have known. Uh, we can because some of, the, some of the interiors at the United Nations in uh, New York, which is from about 1947, they're very reminiscent of some of these interiors. It might be either, either yeah, it, it could be also from the end of the 40s, early 50s. I, I have to, I have to check. Um, unfortunately, I do not know. But I, 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 it's an excellent building. It's, it's almost like a domestic uh, courthouse. You know? There is a level of domesticity. Because of the warmth of the of the wood, it's a public building, but also you feel uh, intimate within this building, and I think this is very reassuring, because you know you go to the courthouse with troubles, of course, you don't need uh, you know to be frightened, to be further frightened or dwarfed or uh, so. I think it you is. could be in the lounge of a hotel in that uh, previous picture. This one, huh? Yeah. It's almost like a hotel uh, lobby or lounge. Mm. Also, the, the many plants, you know, uh, the presence of plants uh, are, you know, is uh, an invitation to try to conciliate and to, to, to make peace. You know, look at the detail, you know, the first part of this stair, you know, is, is different than the others. And he also the, 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 the parapet also becomes different. Also look at this exquisite um, little machineries, you know, uh, everything is a cre little creation, you know, an invention, even the lamps, they are, they are, they are excellent. Some private houses, uh, this one I like very much, but others uh, are a little bit too, too, too bucolic, but in a very discreet way. Uh, 
because I, I do think the Swiss in general, uh, I have a lot of respect for nature and uh, for the essentials of life, really. Um, Kind of strange that, that um, you know uh, where the fire is placed uh, in, in, the, in the immediate vicinity of the of the of the steps. The plants are interesting. I mean, if, if we look at the one at the bottom, you know, the, the way he amplified a certain perspective on that corridor. And there are interesting interventions if, if we study more in detail certain aspects of the building. Uh, another, uh, you know, kind of similar with two, well, actually, is it? I'm confused. It's the same building or is yeah sorry uh, now this is the this is the building of, of, of this villa I'm still confused because it's so similar to the previous one I think is I am confused sorry this now this this building is uh, is um, I don't know what to think about the, the elevation you know it's 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 whimsical but it, it's I think it's not too uh, I think its sense of uh, playfulness is uh, a little bit too decorative for my taste but maybe its level of innocence is not too low I hope. Anyway, this is not uh, uh, his uh, his best architecture, I think. Um, I think in the in the pub public realm, he he was uh, he was more impressive. With the cemetery and the public um, library and the courthouse in Göteborg. Another villa, uh, very different from from the other one. But these were actually earlier works, so maybe this I should have presented at, at the beginning, not at the end of the presentation. Now, this cinema I saw uh, in Stockholm, uh, it's a public uh, space, of course, and this is a presentation drawing. Uh, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a special place. Um, I hope I have images of it. I made this uh, presentation uh, one or two years ago. Yeah, this is how it looks like, and he, it includes uh, these uh, these uh, sculptures that uh, support, you know, uh, they 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 act as, as columns, and so there is a sense of uh, you know culture and history and mythology and uh, maybe uh, appropriately for a for a cinema. Scandia Theater. This was obviously from before the war. Now I'll sh just show a few. Pictures. It's a bit Las Vegas, isn't it? Well, I mean, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's it's. I I, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know if I, I would refer to Las Vegas because uh, you know this is a, this is a European city that has a historical tradition and this was built before the, the Second World War. Uh, I understand why you, you thought of, of Las Vegas, but uh, uh, I, I, I'm afraid that in Las Vegas the, the historical continuity or the cultural continuity 
is just mimicked. It's not. It's not right. Important. So here, here it's uh, it's more uh, genuine in terms of its foundation. Yeah, uh, mm. perhaps. Okay. So uh, you'll see a few a few works by uh, by other architects to to add an extension to the Stockholm Public Library. And uh, this is the hill uh, that uh, I told you I met that uh, man on a bench somewhere here. So I was climbing from here anyway. Uh, so this is the building by, uh, by Gunnar Asplund, uh, the Temple of Books. And uh, someone, of course, <laughs> who was not a contextualist proposed this. Uh, you know, I'm sure the sense of reticence of the Swedes was shattered. Uh, another project also, you know, I think the Swedish spirit is more subtle and uh, I don't think it, it appreciates very much uh, violences uh, of, of any kind, but uh, I just showed the, a few projects not necessarily chosen on, 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 on the merit of their merit. Uh, this is a landscape architecture. Um, if I can call it so, this is a, another, you know, contemporary melodrama. Uh, and uh, I thought of participating here in this competition too, and I, I would have placed the extension underneath the hill, completely hidden, like a, a big cave underneath the hill. But it was, we were not allowed to, to do this. But uh, I thought, why add here? I don't know what, when uh, you can create a, a big cavernous uh, space, uh, quite interesting underneath the hill unless who knows what is underneath that hill. Uh, this is the center of uh, uh, Stockholm. So a very important uh, site in a very important city. There were almost 1000 projects because it was a very famous uh, competition. That's it. Okay, so uh, we did this. Um, now, it's up to you. If you want to, if you are not tired, uh, I could uh, I could uh, show you uh, Calatrava. Although Calatrava requires a little bit of <laughs> a little bit of mm. energy, but uh, maybe with a little bit of encouragement from you, I could do it. Or we could uh, leave it from for another time. Uh, it is really up to you. Uh, if you want, uh, you who are still here. Uh, let me see. I know almost everybody here, except two or three people. What do you think? Are you up to Calatrava or? Uh... Uh, definitely up for it, but I only have 25 minutes. So <laughs> I could do it, I guess, in 25 minutes quickly. Do you? Do everybody else want to to see Calatrava in 25 minutes? We could even call it Calatrava in 24 minutes by now. <laughs> that would be nice. Okay, that I'm doing it. So Calatrava in almost 23 minutes. Just a second. <laughs> no, it's still 25. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, thank you for, for being generous. Okay, so let me just... Uh, okay. Uh, Calatrava, okay. Santiago Calatrava. Uh, okay. Now 24 or 23 or 25 is not a big difference between them. Santiago, Santiago Calatrava. Now maybe I, I need, I mean, I think I need some help here. I know he, I think he studied engineering first now. And um, it's not very clear to me. Uh, I know he, he studied with Eduardo Toroja. Um, I, don't, I don't know if he studied architecture. Um, <laughs> I think he looks like a man who, who, who gave, gave troubles to many people. Uh, in fact, mm. that's what I read. Uh, he was immensely successful and he is immensely successful. That, that he has also 
very, very strong criticism, especially for what he did to, to New York City, uh, but uh, not just New York City, Venice as well. We'll arrive there. So in 23 minutes, 24 minutes, we'll try to, to say a few things about Calatrava. Now, in El Ponte di Calatrava in, uh, in, uh, in Venice was a disaster. Is a disaster. I have seen it. It's near Stazione Termini, near, sorry, near Stazione Santa Lucia, so the, the railway station in Venice. And uh, in, surprisingly, he didn't pay attention to the subtleties of Venetian culture. He built a, you know, a bridge that is his signature bridge. But as you can see, attenzione, pavimento scivoloso. Uh, it's very possible some people lost their legs on the because he put glass on the on the on, on an urban uh, bridge. Uh, I hope we are. I don't know why this I created two or three years ago. Maybe I have images or it was not built then. No, no, I think it was built. Anyway, sorry about this. Uh, you can find pictures on the web with this uh, bridge in Venice. It was a disaster. Many people in Venice asked for it uh, being demolished. Uh, an early work by him, a warehouse in Germany. So now we start with the, the earliest works, 1985. So 35 years ago, uh, I think it's a good work. You know, it's a it's a it's a warehouse, but you see the presence of the architect, especially at the entrance, and uh, you know even these drawings uh, show uh, sophistication and uh, the geometry and uh, the poetry of building. It's I think good. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, all kinds of, this man built so much that, uh, you know, I, I think you would be very nervous to know that I tried to exhaust him in 20 uh, whatever minutes. Um, Puente de la, la Milo in Sevilla, 1992. Now, of, of course, this is, uh, you know, the emblematic uh, image with the Calatrava. Uh, you know, there is the bridge also built in Rotterdam by UN. Uh, which is maybe not very different from this one in a certain sense, but the much, the span is, is, uh, is, is bigger than here. Uh, Kenneth Frampton wrote once, I, I don't know if it was a book or uh, an article on Calatrava, and it, its title was, Look, No Hands. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, it was a reference to the one who bikes without the hands on the hand with the, on the handles yeah. of the of the bike. And this is the exhibitionism of, of Calatrava. It is a tour de force, sometimes uh, very seductive, but you could have some question marks relating to to the depth of the of, of the show, if there is indeed a depth. But he's an excellent builder, no doubt, and a designer of, of great, uh, great uh, courage. I just don't understand why he, he finds pleasure in uh, doing little uh, placid watercolors <clears throat> with his own paintings after they were built. Uh, anyway, um, as you know, he built a lot uh, and uh, builds a lot. Uh, and now he will build the, the tallest building ever, maybe, if the pandemic and other crises allow us to. Although he does look like a modest man, I don't think he's so modest. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. I, I, sometimes it's difficult to judge someone from a mere appearance. Now you know this, the City of Arts and Sciences in Valencia, uh, which is a very impressive work. Uh, it seems futuristic. It seems, uh, you know, clearly destined for the future. Uh, you might not even sh be sure if this was meant for the Earth or some and other seems planet. seems also very dead. Pardon? Seems also very dead and abandoned. Uh, yeah, I, I imagine. Uh, uh, it, it is a grandiose uh, gesture uh, with some, uh, for me, unexplainable uh, things. 
but uh, they, they built it. It kind of looks like uh, something from an alien world that crashed onto the earth. <laughs> yeah, I, they, yeah. They used it as a set piece for the last Westworld, the season three of Westworld. But it, I was <laughs> there. I was there in well, I don't know 2010. There was some IS. IASS Congress 2009, 10, 11, something around that time. And I went there. There was nobody. Nothing was open. Everything was closed. I, I didn't get it. I totally didn't understand. It seemed like to me a little bit like, you know, what they had in China. Um, they built entire cities and nobody's going there. Right. And it was a bit like, you know, before the crisis hit Spain, the European economy crisis hit Spain tremendously. It seemed like they, they built crazy stuff in Spain for nothing and then a crisis hit and and, and they had like uh, you know used all the money for all these this amazing projects but they weren't in use I had the same feeling that a lot of projects also from Herzog and Temeron in Barcelona so I don't know what what this seems to be like totally empty devoid of any any life at least when I was there so maybe if somebody else has been there and, and something was going on please let me know but According to my experience, it was just empty shells. No, no. It, 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 I mean, you know, even without knowing what you said, you you would expect uh, such a destiny. It's a grandiose uh, architecture that is uh, divorced from uh, from life in, in many ways, and that's why uh, Mahadev mentioned, you know, that the alien. Uh, though she used the word alien, you know. Um, the Spaniards also built uh, an airport, which was never used, a whole airport. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I, I personally have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm critical of Calatrava that he spends his uh, talent and his influence to build uh, things that are, uh, you know, you will arrive at the work in Manhattan, where also there was a lot of opposition to that uh, so-called transportation hub which is, uh, you know... Uh... And, you know, my, if I may add, my biggest criticism about uh, this project is everything is very, uh, more or less organically shaped. Apart from the whole infrastructure where you walk, you have to walk in, in rectangles. So I totally did never understand why I have to walk 90 degrees around there to get to these buildings rather than have a fluent, more direct, curvy, line around the buildings it totally it really annoyed me a lot because you know everything is nicely sort of curved but not the pathway for people they have to go then in an actual manner either towards or around it like a like a renaissance garden it absolutely made no sense for me well his architecture in general is aggressive this is not an architecture that that doesn't have aggressivity you can see even in this picture. Uh, I, I mean, a uh, psychoanalyst might have uh, an interesting subject here to talk about. Yeah, and, and also urbanistically, or uh, the way how it is arranged is one object after another. It's like a fruit platter. You have a banana, you have an orange, and you have an apple, and they have nothing to do with each other. They're, they're objects designed and successively built, but in no way related to each other. It's like a zoo. I'm, I'm very critical about this project. Actually, I hate it. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I understand. Um, it's uh, it's almost a monument to nothingness. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and what is this thing here? You know, uh, this thing. What is it? I mean. I, it, to me, it has no function at all. And, you know, it's, yes, cultural, but uh, is it enough? Anyway. Uh, but, but here you see here you see the master plan. You have like the, on the right side, you have the lentil, sh the big lentil shape. And then in the middle, you have the small lentil shape. You th should think you could walk through this axis directly to the um, rib structure. Um, but no, you have to walk around it, around the water, and then you can go to the center. It's absolutely nonsensical. You cannot walk the central spine through the buildings. You have to walk around them. 
Florian, the answer, the explanation is very simple. It's just a, you know, a lesser designer, a bad designer. What can we do? I am. I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, but really, I mean, anyway, look, yes, it's, it's incredible. He's, uh, I mean, the, the otherness of the structures is, uh, you know, something worth considering. It's not, but uh, I, I, I don't know. Anyway, he has interesting things, you know, happening. Uh, and some of the, some, some other works are, are, are better. Um, than this one, even this one could be impressive, you know, for to take pictures of, you know, uh, during the night or during the day. Anyway, I have to like, accelerate a little bit because this man. But but don't, but don't you think it's it's funny that in order to complete the building, you need to have a night picture and the reflection of the water. Otherwise, it's just half a building. Well, yeah, of course, um, you know. No, but maybe it doesn't look too without interest, uh, even without the, the reflection. I don't know. I I have seen. Of course, of course, I'm cynical. But when, for instance, this the, the the building you show right now, I went there and I could not find the entrance. Honestly, where is the entrance in this thing? And then I, I finally found it. It was closed, and we snuck in, and it felt like I'm I'm going into not a you have this grand gesture of all these arches and everything, and I have to snuck in into some, some form of side entrance to, to get into this thing. Mm. I was like completely like, the, you cannot do this gesture and then you cannot design an entrance. What is that? It's not designed for the occupants. It's designed as a grand gesture. And it's designed for um, other beings, not for, for humans. So it's, it's for mm. other people from other planets or who knows or for his grandmother, or who knows. Um, anyway, let's not be too malicious towards Calatrava, because anyway, he doesn't care about our maliciousness. Um, but yeah, it is, uh, it is uh, just like Ricardo Bofill's works in, in Paris, you know, grandiose uh, architectures, but uh, meaning what, you know? Anyway, come on, Monsieur Calatrava. Uh, we move forward, maybe for these animals, which are not alive any longer. Maybe they were meant for them. <laughs> maybe he's a, he's a closet paleontologist. It's possible, yes. Yes. <laughs> maybe it's not an accident at all. But these things are there. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, maybe, yeah. OK, so. Um, City of Arts and Sciences, that was it. This, this one I, I visited. And I have to tell you, next to it is a building by Iro Sarina, the great uh, uh, Finnish North American architect. And he built a much more modest building, also a museum of art, but I admired it more than the building by Calatrava. Although, of course, the building of Calatrava is intended to impress but that's exactly what turned me off, that it was too much showmanship. It was too much look, no hands. And uh, you'll see, I hope I have it here, the building by Iro Sarina, which to me is more real architecture than, than uh, what Calatrava did. All this thing, you know, he keeps repeating this thing with a flying building, but the flying building doesn't have to have wings. It doesn't have to fly literally. You know, it doesn't have to move its wings. You make it flying in spirit, not uh, in, 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 in the letter. And Dan I, ha Dan, I have seen this building. Me too. Um, be, I mean, for the first time that I saw the building, I was quite e excited by the fact that the wings were kind of flying. So, I mean, for me, it was the first uh, experience of seeing a building just performing mechanically in that way. So from that point of view, it was quite in interesting. But I don't know, you know, um, how many times you'll get excited about something like that. <laughs> and, it, and it is quite a large kind of a structure. It's very big. Um, so, yeah. You know, you know, there is a word for this. It's, it's not a kind word. It's a gimmick. That's what it is. It's a gimmick, a very expensive gimmick. 
Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. This, this, is, this is architecture of the late capitalism. This is not doing anything other than attracting people. And this is showmanship in build form. This is, it is, it is not even performative. I mean, it could close for giving shade, but I mean, making something so extraordinarily uh, difficult and, 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 and even the energy amount you need to close the thing for a little bit of shading, it's, it, oh, man, uh, sorry, I mean, it, it makes me just angry. This is like- Yes, it's, it's very wasteful. Exactly. I, I'm just wondering whether it is architecture or it is mechanics and the structure uh because i when i went inside the building i didn't kind of feel that i was in a, what i would call architecture where there would be a very kind of intrigued flow of a space in the space behaving in different ways of you know you kind of have different forms next to each other and create a another form etc it didn't work like that so in it looks is a huge object has got some some first uh, kind of impression mix but i wonder if it is architecture or it is just a structure and mechanics uh, well you see here on the left this is the building by Iro Sarinan, and i hope i have other pictures of it because here you have i think uh, two very different architects this mm -hmm. is uh, Calatrava uh, inside, uh, and uh, you know the schematics of his design, and uh, you know some of his uh, watercolors. Anyway, and yeah, they have very needed watercolors for that stuff. <laughs> I know. I mean, even <laughs> the medium. You know, why would you? I, I don't know. I, I don't like his watercolors. Exactly. So, why would you need watercolors? Why do you try to be a poet? I mean, this is the most lie I've ever seen. I mean, I get really outraged. Make a cut drawing, make a 3D model, but don't play the poet with watercolors. I mean, come on, what? Oh. <laughs> well, you, you see, Florian, the difference between uh, Leverance and, and, uh, and Calatrava. Leverance, you know, with small gestures, he created meaning uh, in architecture. Here we yep. have grandiose gestures and... <laughs> <laughs> totally meaningless. Right. Yeah, but you know, the disconnection of the medium of expression or representation of architecture, how it is perceived towards the build form is 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 enormous because watercolor um, suggests a certain hand handcrafting, a certain level of detail, a certain down to earthiness, right? Right. And 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 then even now all these forms, they are not diagrams, they're not sketches, they are preconceived. He thinks it, he gives it to his people and they have to work out this geometry till it really matches his sketch. This sketch is not a matter of interpretation, it's literal. This is like, he's literal making a drawing of what he thinks and these poor people working for him have to work this thing out. It's not like a matter of interpretation that they could move left or right, it has to look like this. This is mm. preconceived. He is robbing himself of the pos possibility of exploration because he has this already in his head and they have to work it out. This is, this is crazy. I mean, sorry, this guy has no architectural education for me at all. Well, you know, some of these watercolors, if not most of them are done after the building was built. <laughs> Which <laughs> makes it even more bizarre. <laughs> no, it's true. We'll see him in New York City uh, doing watercolors with the building already completed. Yes, I mean, I must say, yes, that I also have encountered when I was working for you in the studio that uh, when the building was opening, I saw a sketch from Ben about the building I've never seen before ever <laughs> when I was designing it. But yeah, okay, that's, that's another story. Well, Although you have to confess, this picture is kind of nice as a <laughs> picture, as a photograph. <laughs> yeah, of course it's. Yeah, sure. Uh, Rodin, we talked about Guise Rodin. There he is. Uh, I think it's uh, Balzac. I love Guise Rodin. And of course, this man is in love with himself, you know. Mm. Anyway, he's not the only one. But this, uh, this building by Salinan from 1957 
for me, is superior architecture to what um, Calatrava did. And it's next to it, you know, modern, mid-century uh, architecture as a great staircase. Uh, and uh, I truly felt when I was there that the true architect was here, was not there, was not where mm. Calatrava was. And, you know, this kind of modernism is not really even my most uh, admired or preferred architecture. But compared to, to Calatrava, I liked more, even in terms of how it was built, you can yes. tell that the building by Sarin has more seriousness and even in the choice of materials. But, but this, this is kind this of cheaply built. Uh, but this, is an interesting built. Thing. This, this building has a certain complexity uh, or a spatial richness, even though it is a plinth and then it's the, the, the columns of the lotti and then there's the floating volume on top of the courtyard. Of course, it takes from certain typologies, but it makes it spatially already interesting. You want to explore, whereas this mm. Calatrava is just complicated. There is no spatiality to it or very little, let's say. And and this is a this is a building to be occupied. The Calatrava one is one to be observed and photographed from a distance. Yeah, it's an object. It's an object. Yeah. Yes, an object. Yes, a great building doesn't uh, receive well the word uh, the description object. Okay, so um, I mean this building draws you in. Uh, you you want to go there. No, no, sorry, no, no, his birthday will come to was was truly a very good architect, too bad he died young. Uh, mm. But he did build, uh, you know, uh, significantly. Was this and, the, the father of the father or the son? This was the father. The son. Right? Sorry, no? The son, okay. Sorry. Yeah, the father is called uh, El Elil, uh, and this one is Ero, the E E R O. Oh, e -R -O. Okay. And because yeah. of the of the son. Sorry, my history is not very good. Uh, no, no, uh, you know, and, and because of, uh, of, of Iro Sarina, meaning the author of this uh, museum, Sydney has the opera in Sydney because he was the, the chief juror of that competition. I don't know uh -huh. if you know the story. And it's a very interesting story. And very quickly, I'll try to squeeze it in the 25 uh, minutes. Uh, his plane arrived in Sydney one day later. This is the, the story. And in the meantime, the other jurors took the project by John Hudson and eliminated it. Eliminated ah. it because they thought it was not worthy of uh, attention. So Sarinan, who at that time was building the TWA uh, terminal in, uh, in uh, JFK in New York, and mm. he, who, he was also a, a responsible uh, member of the jury. In fact, he was the chief of the jury, he wanted to see the eliminated projects. So he discovered the drawing by Hudson. Uh, and, huh. you know, uh, being in the position he was, he was able to, to convince the other members that this project is worthy of, of uh, having a different destiny than the garbage can. And that's why Sydney has now the opera in Sydney. You see? Uh. That's such an interesting story. Okay, yeah. I didn't know that. Yes, if 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 Iro Sarinan was not himself involved, mm. uh, Sydney would, would have had a very different opera, or who knows, maybe no no opera at all. I I, I don't know. And yeah. without the Sydney Opera House, maybe my firm would not exist. There. In its <laughs> current form. <laughs> so you know, all things connect. Yeah, all things connect. Interesting. Mm. I know it's a it's a good building. And sorry, you know, I mean, look at this staircase. It's great. You know, it's it's uh, uh, it, it's it's a good building. And you can tell from this picture that actually the building by Calatrava, despite its uh, enormous uh, wings, uh, is built very cheaply. You know. Uh, I mean, look at that class part, you know, it, it, you can tell it, there are no complex details on anything, you know, it's just... Well, the budget was expanded on all the sort of uh, gratuitous <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, gymnastics, right? Right, the gymnastics indeed.
I love this staircase. I mean, look at it. It's, 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 it's beautiful. Anyway, it was an occasion. This is the TWA uh, uh, mm -hmm. terminal that he built. It, can you go back on one slide, please? Yes. Oh, that's uh, very nice. That's gorgeous, yes. So uh, at that time when he judged the competition for the Opera in Cine, he was building uh, the TWA terminal in uh, the JFK uh, airport. And uh, you know, he saw some similarity in, in, the, in, in the design by John Hudson. And this was a brilliant uh, building and still is. Uh, you mm. know, uh, this was done without, uh, you know, parametrics and without, uh, yeah. you know, the, the, the capabilities of today. It was manual work, but look at the handling of the space. Mm. And uh, it, uh, yeah, we recently had the great honor of being able to renovate this. Which was, I, uh, which was really uh, over Arup, uh, renovated it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's no longer uh, used as a terminal, but it's, uh, I think it's, it's a hotel program mainly. Mm. But it's, it's now a, a landmark building, so uh, I'm sure the Port Authority would have preferred to demolish it, uh, given their uh, um, proclivities, but uh, it was instead renovated. It's kind yeah. of moving. It, it is a kind of a building space that you, you kind of visualize it in movies. Yeah. You know, it's got theatrical, cinematic kind of photographic uh, imaging about it. But look at the drawings, you know, this is just, yeah. uh, you know, the information, information booth. And, and you, you, even if you might say, come on, this is not so different from what Calatrava does. I think it is. Mm. It is completely it's different. Yeah, yep. very different. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I mean, yes, we, we can say there is some formal, some shape, some form similarities in it, sort of of the organic. But I mean, if you look at the interior, you know, how he starts to introduce all these different levels of stairs and um, the interior sculpture, that immediately becomes spatial, it immediately becomes something which is related to to people you know this is not just a, a, a big hall with nothing you know and that, that makes the difference the integration of all these elements how you go up and down well here you're creating an experience rather than a spectacle yes, yes exactly yes that's that's i think you're absolutely right this is absolutely different something you can do with a building uh, rather than you know just being passive mm. next to it and that's it Okay, so now back to Mr. Calatrava, uh, the uh, Olympic Sports uh, Arena in Athens. By the way, it seems that my uh, uh, deadline has disappeared, so uh, I can stay for a little longer. <laughs> okay, then, in okay. case you are rushing, you don't need to rush. No. Okay, okay, thank Just you. Just for my my case, you don't need. Okay, no. thank you. Uh, well, okay, uh, we'll take a little more time. Um, so. Um, yeah, this is what he did in Athens. And I mean, he, is, he has some uh, interesting ideas, but uh, he repeats them so they become mannerisms. And it doesn't matter what it is, a train station, an arena, a museum, uh, he uses them over and over again. Um, I wonder how sustainable his buildings are because they appear to be quite difficult to maintain, you know, mm. yeah. Yes, the maintenance is one issue, but also the use of materials. For example, I'm sure we'll come to the project in New York. There's uh, the amount of steel that's in there is a way in excess of what you would really need to enclose the volume. Mm. Yes, they look kind of, although, I mean, there's an attempt to make them look quite uh, thin, but they look very heavy. And I would also like to add to that, you know, I mean, the, the sustainability and, and sort of um, material use of a building and embodied energy and so on and so forth. I personally don't mind if there's a building which is maybe not performing energetically that well or in terms of material usage. 
but um, you know, then it, it's, it's a special building, a one in a kind, but then it has to make up for that in terms of what does it offer programmatically and spatially and, and, and maybe for all uh, the people. Yeah. Absolutely, I totally agree with you uh, there. So it's in, in the service of what has that uh, resource been expanded? And, and, and with Kalatwafa, I have the feeling there's over, or most of the time it's service for itself, you know, and, yeah. and nothing else. Mm. Well, he gets them built. That's very kind of questionable. Mm. Although, you know, that structure you just showed, could you go back one? Oh, sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm. this one is not so bad, actually of all of them in terms of trying to create a roof over a stadium this is kind of elegantly and economically done if the diagram actually is a good representation of what was actually built it probably isn't <laughs> <laughs> no but yes i understand there's a diagram yes it's, it's, it's convincing but somehow it looks mm. uh, i mean no here it looks okay but uh, i'm confused a little bit is it the same building it should be Is this the same building? I don't know. Well, that's what I asked myself. I don't think so. I don't think so. Roof looks different. No, but that's what it is, the Athens Olympic Sports Complex. Maybe, maybe he designed several uh, alternatives. I don't know. Hmm. Anyway. Um, another auditorium now this oh, one again. again you know this same thing at the top you think it's a cobra you know it's a it's a, it's a big snake above what what is this thing here you know what, it's ugly isn't it what it's pretty ugly well <laughs> you know uh, yeah. It's a character from Star Wars. No, but look here, you know, I mean, yes, when you look at this concrete uh, surface, it's impeccably built, it's so thin. It's, uh, there are things to be admired here, but what is its meaning? I mean, what does it do? Mm -hmm. Do you know? It can't have any performative function. It's purely a visual spectacle. It bends over and looks down on its navel and looks what its navel mm. is doing. Mm. It, it surprises me that he can be so frivolous. You know, we are talking about, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a famous architect of today. But this said something about our world, you know, that we are seduced by, by, uh, by spectacles and, more, and much less uh, by, by uh, you know, real genuine experiences. And this is very sad. Yes, I know we live in a world dominated by media and scandals and, uh, you know, sensationalism. We know it. But how come that, you know, I mean, he's highly regarded, although I understood he's also highly hated. Yeah. <laughs> well, his client for the, the building in New York has personally expressed to me how uh, angry he was about that project. <laughs> <laughs> we'll arrive there because I have various quotations from New Yorkers who are, who are outraged by that building. Um, it, it was a, a, a subset um, of, of the overall space of, of connecting that we exist in. Um, and by having them join us, uh, they certainly went from being a competitor in the space of, of being a mobile camera uh, to an, an app that we could help grow um, and help get more people to be able to use and, and, and be on our team. And so what, what was that? I have no idea. <laughs> no, I, 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 it's strange. Anyway. Um, yeah, but even here you can take some interesting pictures, but it is a spectacle, yes. And that thing above is really grotesque. 
It doesn't matter. In fact, uh, I understand the irritation of, uh, of Florian, you know, uh, to use watercolors to, you know, placidly represent such things is uh, even more infuriating. Yes. Where does the form come from and why? And how does it relate to its context, which it doesn't? Well, they come from the, from the, you know, from his head, you know, they, uh -huh. yeah. you know, anyway. Imaginations, yeah, well, is is yeah, this case. But actually his drawings are not so good. If you compare his drawings with the, with the architectural drawings of some uh, great masters of the past, you realize because he, uh, as Le Corbusier said, you cannot lie in a drawing. A drawing tells the truth. These drawings are actually, I could claim that I see him with his uh, true uh, dimensions, so to speak, through these drawings. These, the drawings are infantile. Yes, the forms are interesting sometimes, but these are not drawings of a, of a, a very complex or, or, or a very sensitive man. If you see drawings of fortifications, were fortifications by me, Michelangelo, then you see genius. Here yeah. you see a, you know, a man who does some sketches, but uh, I don't think they have, they have um, you know, complexity and richness and sensitivity, no. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, with the exception, I still don't know. This irritates me beyond measure. This thing is you know, <laughs> no, really, so useless. So, so well, it, it is one of those things that you just kind of think, oh well, so what? You know, no, it, it's pompous, you know, and it's also aggressive. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, when I created this PowerPoint presentation, uh, for some reason, I, I introduced this word and I think this describes his architecture. Param, pam, pam, pam. I mean, mm. you know, spectacle. Param, pam, pam, pam. Mm. Mm. Is that a song? A Christmas song? I don't know what it is, but uh, there must have been a reason I, I, I put this, uh, this word here. Anyway, I'm tired of you. I'm beginning to be tired of you. Uh, of Calatrava. Mm. Uh, look at him. Can you imagine? The, I mean, you know, this is unbelievable. You know? Look at the worker, you know. This is himself posing for the paparazzi and, and, and mimicking that he's contributing to. It's, it's so fake, you know. I mean, he, yeah, didn't, <laughs> he didn't have to masquerade. That's ridiculous, really. He didn't have to masquerade himself in this way. It's, it's, it's this total... he, he, he's also actually disrespecting the people that do this work, in a way. <laughs> Unbelievable. Anyway. Mm. Anyway, mm. right. Anyway, move forward. Uh, we saw this. I'm tired of this building. Move, move, move beyond it. Communications tower in Barcelona. This one I saw. It's okay, you know. It's a communications tower. It's a smaller... Although the tower in Malmo, I think is good, and Ulla right, but um, this one- it, it, looks, it looks more like a memorial than a communication tower. Mm -hmm. A little bit, yes, maybe, yeah, the, in the memory of the dead soldier or something. Yeah. Mm. But that aspect of uh, look now hands is present here too. The expeditionism, oh, yes. yes. The spectrum the spectacle. Now you see Gaudi in the front. Uh, you know, finally back to some, some reality and some beauty, which has nothing to do, of course, with Santiago Calatrava. Mm. Okay, this, this tower though, I, I liked when I visited uh, Malmö 
and uh, I think it, it, it is very well built. And uh, you know, be, he did it before other people began to use twistings in their architecture. Mm. And uh, it's, I think it's, it's, it's not a bad work. Now, of course, you could yeah, ask this, why this, the twisting. This is, but, yeah, but this is clearer in its intention. Uh, yes, so. yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And less uh, capricious in a way besides the twisting. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a certain regularity as well. And it, the proportion, the scale, it, yeah. I think it's a good building. And it's, it's built impeccably. Now this city of, of, of the, the, the city of the future in Malmö impressed me very much. Uh, and uh, again, if you arrive in Sweden, uh, if you arrive in Malmö, maybe you'll visit it. Um, very sophisticated uh, in the sense, in the good sense of the word. So this is the plan uh, of, of the tower. Now, I don't know, but he tries to convince me, you know, based on, uh, you know, <laughs> the movement of the yeah. human body. Uh, he, he's a showman. He's, uh, he's, he's trying to sell something that already was sold because of the intrinsic quality of the tower. And it's fine. You don't have to become too literal in your attempt to, uh, you know, convince me. It's fine. Twisting tower argument uh, was also used very often at the UN studio for their towers mm. as a sculptural, um, whatever analogy or reference. The twisting torso. Sort of looks as if it is too short. It needs to be higher to have a better, to give it better pleasing kind of view to the eyes. No, no, it is tall, but it depends where you see it from. Um, mm. Anyway. Yeah. It's probably not the worst uh, place in the world to live in. <laughs> uh, Mr. Galadra. It, it's, a, it's a residential tower, is it? Right. Oh, OK. Mm. A residential tower, yes. Those, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, well, it's built very well. As you can tell, it's not the shortest tower in the world. I mean, but for the scale of Malmö, it's quite tall. Maybe too tall, but anyway. Aside from being the 2014 winner of the biggest loser, Bungled Chicago developments, Calatrava is known for suing and being sued, going over budget and being made fun of by hackish New York food critics. Oh, and the all white other worldliness of, of his designs. This was proposed for Chicago, but uh, it was not built. And uh, I'm happy it was not built. The infinity tower. You know, uh, interestingly, what was built was a big hole for the foundation. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and uh, one of my uh, uh, students this time did a project to put something else in the hole that was quite sustainable, <laughs> which was interesting. <laughs> to put what? To put uh, put a facility, a kind of spa facility, and occupy the hole, you know, so that you don't see anything above the ground. Right. <laughs> but you fill the hole with something useful. <laughs> right. Now the Infinity Tower uh, in Dubai, uh, which is also the twisting. Um, you know, it was finished. Uh, now. Uh, Okay. Why is it called the Infinity Tower? Because, because it would be the, the tallest in the world. This one, um, you know, uh, oh. one kilometer tall or one mile. I forgot. Um, so um, I 
Oh, sorry, this one, right, okay. Um, this one. Yeah, so what was that one that you showed before that uh, looked as if it was still under construction? Is that this? No, no, it's not this one. That's why I'm a little- This one, yeah, of, 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 what is this? I, I don't think, I. you know, when uh, I, it's possible that this has a different name. This one was built, but the, the infinity tower is, is this one. Is that one okay? Sorry, yes. uh, forgive me. It's my no, no, I'm sorry because there is a confusion there that I created. Um, yeah, well, uh, you know, what can you say if you build so high, you, you know, you but who knows? Maybe the crisis we are in and the virus and so on. Will, make us sustain. What would be the necessity for building so high? Well, the necessity no is to show ourselves that we are godlike. And there, there's a competition between sheikhs. Mine is bigger than yours. So uh, right. that's another thing that's going on. Mm. Actually, it's part of being human. I mean, we used to make what we call now world wonders. And I think this is now the, the remnants of it, building skyscrapers as high as possible. Tribute to the eagles. You know, I remember, uh, uh, and I may get the details here wrong, uh, doing uh, a study some time ago on the, the height of buildings uh, in the context of some project and really uh, up to about uh, 40 or 50 stories it makes some sense to, to build tall and uh, save on transportation and uh, make uh, best optimized use of foundations and things like that but above that it becomes purely a sort of egotistical uh, exercise. Yeah, this is an interesting observation. Maybe one day we'll talk more about this. Uh, it's also a structural exercise, if I may say. I mean, how high can we build now? I mean, it's it's more about also conquering the current engineering, actually, isn't it? Yeah, but the question is for what use? For what? What is the end of it? What What is the purpose of it? <laughs> Well, it, Other than showing that you can. Yeah, it has to do with human ego, yes. No question. You know, it's, uh, and uh, there is an interesting thing if you look at uh, tall buildings historically, uh, the creation of the next iconic tallest building has usually just preceded uh, the next big recession. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> If we take the column as a symbol of kind of element that pushes the sky away from the earth, so it gives you some perception about, about you know, how far we are in this space. It, it, this is just taking that to a much higher level and throwing the sky so much far higher, you know. Um, but the thing is that if it is any kind of in kind of any space for habitation on the top end of it, then it will always be behind the clouds, I think, about a kilometer above. And so, it, I mean, the, how would you feel living in that sort of a space where there would be never cloud to see? But look at look at the foot footprint of the of the tower. So it's one kilometer tall, but it's also half a ki uh, half a kilometer in diameter, the footprint, as opposed to the other towers. So it's a little bit taller than uh, the the other one, the Burj Khalifa or how it is called. Yeah. But mm -hmm. but the footprint is immense. So I have a, I have a question, Madhav. Um, at what size uh, is the wind load at the tower higher than the vertical load that you, you know, uh, that becomes really 
uneconomical. Un is it there 40 stories, as you said before? Or? Um, it actually depends where you're building. So if you're building in Singapore, the, the wind load is, uh, is significantly less than if you're building in, say, Hong Kong. Mm. Uh, so it does depend on the wind environment. But I think by the time you start exceeding 50 stories, and if Bruce was on the call, he would be a much better person to ask that question to. Uh, definitely, even with Raymond Abraham's project, on uh, which is was 22 stories, but it was very slender. It was only 25 uh, feet by uh, something like uh, uh, 80 feet deep. And mm. So it was like a pencil. So the slenderness. Uh, is another issue where uh, the the wind load starts dominating. So on that building, the wind load was a big deal, even though relatively speaking, it's a short building. I see. So in some ways, what, what you see here with the Calatrava's tall tower is by using all these guy ropes, uh, he has essentially reduced the slenderness of his building to make it uh, therefore more sort of resistant to wind. Mm -hmm. So the the like the uh, fourth tower from the left is very slender. If you look at it, uh, the height to the size of the base, and yes. you would expect there the wind to be uh, a much more significant issue. Now, of course, you I mean with with Calatrava's case, you can build underneath the tensile structure which he uses to yeah to buy the tower. But but you know, funnily, in a way, the foot, uh, at least from the graphic, the footprint. Basically, uh, then you could also say, uh, with the same area occupation, we can also build much lower, you know, to, to house the same amount of people. Yeah. So it's not really uh, none of these projects are about efficiency, and uh, you know, I, I don't I don't inherently inherently have a problem with reaching for the skies and trying to break technological barriers and uh, doing the next tallest thing provided we don't try and whitewash it and imply that somehow there's some increased efficiency involved in doing that, because yeah. clearly it's not. It's just an, uh, an exercise in doing it because you can or proving that you can. Yes, I mean, I agree. I mean, this is what we talked earlier. You know, not every building has to be the greenest building, but then at yeah. least be honest about it and we say, okay, it's about, you know, there's one in a kind, we do it once. So yeah. maybe. If the building is kind of not so solid at the bottom and is tensile structure, then with the movement of the air through the structural element, wouldn't it create a quite disturbing noise? <laughs> the singing. Well, it, it could, it could. <laughs> and I think that that, uh, that is actually a consideration. And uh, of course, the thing is that those uh, cables are all under very high tension. So you would have to make sure that uh, the uh, uh, resonant frequency of those cables is not something that can be generated by the typical wind velocities that you get. In, in you get the resonance catastrophe, you mean? Sorry, I missed that. Now that you don't get the uh, catastrophe uh, of the vibration of the of the <laughs> of the cable. Right, well, there are two things. One is that the, the vibration of the cable can create a, a problem and a catastrophe. The other is, uh, uh, without even getting to that point, you can get whistling sounds from from those cables mm -hmm. if they can vibrate. Uh, if there's some vibration that's excited by the wind. Mm. Uh, how would how would that sort of material wear out in in the kind of heat and the atmosphere as it is, you know, in this in in the place is going to be built or is designed for? Well, it's it's no different to the cables on the Brooklyn Bridge that have uh, kind of uh, lived now for. Uh, uh, over a hundred years, I think the Brooklyn Bridge, right? Yeah. Uh, so I mean, it, it's all in the matter of uh, choosing the material and choosing the protection for the for the material as well, and also but, choose choosing to have a methodology for replacement because nothing lasts forever. Yeah. Well, the Brooklyn Bridge is kind of horizontal. Yeah. This is vertical, and so the 
the central element, the tallest element, has to have some kind of very strong stability because if that has got some movement, then would that affect the, how would it affect the movement of the whole structure? I mean, uh, in the, in, within the context of the structural elements, behavior within the heat in the, in the place. Do, do you mean you need a, a, the cable over the whole height of the building needs to be per height differently worked out sort of a gradual performative material because uh, the heat impact on let's say on a higher point of the building is different than a lower point of the building therefore there's you need to you cannot have just one sort of cable diameter it needs to be gradually changing according to to, to the requirements um, no, i don't think you need to do that I don't think you need to do that. If, are you are you thinking in terms of corrosion uh, on that? I'm thinking in terms of corrosion and also the expansion and contractions of the. Okay. So, so the expansion and contraction is uh, the way in which you deal with that is you've got to pre-stress the cable so that what happens when it heats up is that the level of pre-stress goes down, but it never goes down to zero. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? So uh, if you have a cable and you stretch it so that there's a certain amount of stress in it and then you heat it up, the cable's yeah. tendency is to expand, but because you've already pre-stressed it, the level of stress goes down as it warms up and then it goes up as, as, it, as it cools down. So all of those things are part of the, the, the job of the, the structural engineer or the structural designer to figure out in advance so that you don't end up with a problem. Yes. Yeah, but this is very interesting because you have like this very big height and this tremendous length of the cable and the sun shines yeah. now on the south and the south side is uh, uh, expanding much more than the northern side. Uh, wouldn't the tower start to lean? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, these are all these are all issues that uh, one hopes that Calatrava has somehow resolved. Yeah, <laughs> because, and, and because it was actually, frankly, it was even an issue on a much shorter building, the uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, in uh, which was Foster's first uh, tall uh, office building in Hong Kong. Not not particularly tall, but the design there is that there's a, a col each of the columns is made up of four posts that are interconnected, and two of those posts are outside the building in yeah. the general environment, and two of them are inside in air-conditioned comfort. So oh. then you have differential temperature variation between the outside columns and the ones on the inside. And uh, we had to do a calculation to figure out if that was going to be a problem or not. And it turned out at the end of the day that it was not a problem, but uh, it was something that was calculated. Yes, that is to, to, to another interesting kind of question, I think, and that is the, when you have two different kind of uh, heat uh, uh, volume on, on each side of the building, the central pole, which is the highest part of this building, and everything is, I assume, connecting to that, it would be pulled and pushed between the two sides because of the expansions and contractions. Right on different sides so would that be therefore of the same material or would that need to be something different and how would that work i don't know if you would choose a different material but it is a point that if you had cables on one side that were being uh, differentially heated compared to cables on the other side you would assume that it would actually cause the central pole to be pulled one way or the other. And maybe that's a feature that is there, that exists. And uh, they just figure out that the level of movement is such that it's not going to bother anybody. And what about the unforeseeable weather? If everything is calculated for mm. a, a foreseen weather, but with the climate change, in times, right. 
But with um, climate change, you're talking about, uh, okay, catastrophic climate change is a two degrees rise in average temperature, right? Mm -hmm. So two degrees rise in terms of the temperature in with regard to the structure is not catastrophic. It's catastrophic for melting ice and raising sea levels and all of that, but it's not catastrophic for structure. So again, we have to, to we can't assume that because a two degree rise in temperature is catastrophic for humanity in one regard, that it automatically becomes a problem for everything else. No, not, not, not necessarily. It's more of a problem for the air conditioning because there'll be more heat gain and uh, the systems have to be sized to deal with a bigger load. It's not really a problem for the structure. So uh, thank you for that explanation. It's very, very useful. Um, I, I'm going to ask you another question, if I may, and that is about the heat observance of these cables. Uh, obviously, in that kind of very hot environment, they will be observing a lot of heat and giving it back. So, you know, how, how safe would that be if a lot of heat is kind of observed at the ground level, for instance? Um, for, for, therefore, there would be a need to use high velocity of air condition, artificial air conditioning in order to create some normality at the ground level. But, but in fact, if you get- Sorry, I, I don't understand uh, what you're saying because these cables are all outside. So basically yeah. they're absorbed, they are achieving the temperature of the air outside. And if yeah. the sun is shining on them, then they'll achieve a temperature which is a few degrees hotter than the air outside, which is on a hot day when you go and you touch the outside of your car that has been sitting in the sun, you know it's it's quite hot to the touch. But hot to the touch is maybe it's at uh, 100, 120 degrees uh, Celsius, so it's unpleasant for you to touch. But at that temperature, the material is coasting. You know, the material is fine. It's not in any way impacted by the presence of that uh, higher temperature. So I don't think you need to worry about the integrity of the material. In terms of what it feels like to be, uh, to be near those cables, if you touch the cable, it's a problem, but the air surrounding the cable is still the same as the air that's uh, everywhere else outside. So it's not going to cause any kind of a problem for pedestrians. Okay, that's, that's very good to know because I was thinking that if the material would give heat back and because there's so much of the material, therefore that would create a, an artificial heat in that kind no, of... No, not really. In, in, in the, the only reason the cable gets hot is because it's intercepting solar radiation that if the cable wasn't there would go further and might hit the road and heat up the road. So the net effect is is uh, is neutral there's no additional heat that's being created by the presence of uh, of this structure okay thank you very much that's very helpful thank you sorry dan we're uh, oh. we're usurping your presentation here so no please. no I, I think it's very important to to stop and discuss things yeah thank uh, you if you wouldn't mind there there is one more thing i would like to say about uh, about this uh, which uh, may or may not apply to Calatrava Tower, but uh, usually when you have these cable supported structures, uh, what it means is that the basic structure itself, the, the cylinder in the middle, is has the structural strength to hold up its own weight, but it does not have the uh, stability. In other words, the level of movement would make it very uncomfortable for people that are within the building. Yeah. So you have, you have strength and then you have another factor which is called serviceability for which you need something to be stiff so it doesn't move. Uh, you don't want people getting seasick in your building. So usually the, the base structure is designed to hold itself up in terms of strength. And then all these cables and things like that are there to make it stiffer so that uh, it doesn't move uh, too much. Right, okay, thank you very much. But uh, uh, Mahadeva, I wanted to ask, what about the tower built by Shaw? Uh, 
uh, close to Central Park, which is so thin and so tall. How how does it handle the you know the wind? Ah, uh, that's a good question. You know, maybe people on the top floor are, are swinging around. I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> because even on the World Trade Center towers, the old ones, uh, I don't know about the new one, uh, I think they said that, that the top would move by up to two meters in, in any direction uh, because of wind. And would they not use kind of uh, expansion joint vertically in order to give it some uh, movement leverage? No, you don't want to do that because that would make it even more floppy than uh, than if you didn't have those things. Oh, okay. Uh, uh -huh. What is sometimes done is you have what's called a tuned mass damper somewhere high up in the building. So as the building starts to sway, you uh, think of it as a as a heavy mass that's inside a viscous liquid. So as the as the mass moves inside the liquid, the the liquid absorbs the energy from that mass and it converts the movement into heat. And so the liquid heats up, but it takes the energy out of the movement and slows down the movement of the building. And these kinds of damp mass dampers are relatively common in tall, spl tall slender buildings. So okay. it could be that that's the, that's the mechanism in the shop building, but I don't know that for a fact. <clears throat> but the, there seems to be a tendency, almost a fashion now, to be very tall and very slender. Uh, yeah, I know. In New York City. And uh, the question is whether the, the fashionability of having an apartment at the upper reaches of one of these very slender towers uh, makes the tenant uh, ignore the fact that, you know, once in a while when, it, when the wind is blowing really hard, it feels uncomfortable to be up there because we're actually very, very sensitive to the floor that we stand on moving around. Of course. You don't, you don't need much movement to, to really feel uh, uh, disoriented and, uh, and unsafe. I, I, I mean, I live on the, in a, on the 13th floor of a building and I do not want anything to move at all. You know, mm. you kind of, yeah. It, it, it wouldn't feel comfortable. No. I wish we had a, a tall building structural engineer on this call rather than myself, a mechanical engineer pretending to be a structural engineer. So <laughs> no, no. <laughs> ne next time we get done, uh, I mean, uh, Bruce, we can ask him uh, some of right. these questions. So we'll, we'll, we'll a tell more technical Bruce. answer. Yeah. Right, we'll tell Bruce to ignore his job and to stay with us to explain. Us yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We'll do so. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move forward. Here is the architect trying to be convincing, and he probably is. Now we arrive at the scandal, Calatrava in New York, yeah. WTC mm. Transportation Hub. <clears throat> this is uh, this is a, a, a machine that uh, consumed a lot of resources. Uh, it's not a cathedral. Uh, it's a, it's a you know, transportation hub. I imagine it's uh, impressive, uh, maybe Mahadev. Oh, it's, it's spectacular. When, when you're in there, it's spectacular. But, you know, it's a spectacle that you uh, appreciate uh, maybe the first time and maybe for a few more times if you visit occasionally. But its purpose is, a, is to basically connect the path railway station up to the office buildings that are up above. So if you're going through there every single day, I'm sure after a while, all of this stuff is lost on you. And uh, um, it's just uh, some place that you go through. Right. Mm. Now, what are these, uh, you know, uh, I mean, they are not structural, those... Uh, no, it's, it's purely, purely decorative. It's unbelievable the amount of loss. I mean, this is obviously an architect who doesn't give a damn about sustainability. I mean, no. you know, how could you build like this, you know, kind of recently, you know, those spikes, uh, plus you'll see some comments, they can be threatening. I mean, again, Mahadev could tell us, what do you feel when you are outside and see these, uh, I mean, how big are these spikes are probably you know, I don't know. I mean, the scale, the scale there is correct. You see the people at the bottom? Right. Mm -hmm. Right? That, that is the scale. So this is... And uh, 
And it is very aggressive. I mean, if you look at all those spikes that are pointing out it, uh, from a distance, it has a, I mean, this looks like uh, an animal that has spikes to defend itself against uh, predators. Uh, and uh, that is the kind of uh, sense that you get when you are there. Of course, because it's so huge, if you're close to the building, you don't get to see that whole uh, perspective of all of the spikes. You only see selected uh, views of them at uh, different places. It surprises me that, you know, uh, the client was willing to pay a large amount of uh, resources of money on, on something that was, you know, uh, decorative, uh, threatening uh, some of, of spikes, you know. I mean, well, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is, and, and this, is, this is purely hearsay, I, I was not there, so I can just tell you what I've heard about the presentation that Calatrava gave to the Port Authority. So it's the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which is a very bureaucratic uh, uh, government organization. Uh, apparently, he presented this like, okay, there was the big disaster, 9-11, this is on this is replacing the station that was in the base of the, the Twin Towers. That's, that's its significance there. And he presented this as a dove taking flight and sort of going back up into the air and uh, you know, rising from, uh, from the turmoil that had occurred there before. And apparently he did an amazing job of that presentation. He had these uh, seasoned bureaucrats sitting there in tears during that presentation. And then they picked this project. And of course, uh, they suddenly discovered that the person that picked had no respect for their budget. But <laughs> given that politically speaking, he had convinced some very high officials uh, of the value of uh, what he was doing here, they couldn't back out and they had to just keep finding extra money to uh, pour into it. So, so the real- Hundreds of millions of dollars extra money. So the real crying came afterwards. <laughs> yeah, kind of, yeah. At the presentation, they were almost in tears, but when they had to pay for it, that's they were really in tears. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Heavy tears. <laughs> right. No, no, it's very cynical of Calatrava to do this. You know, I mean, if you really have uh, respect and affection and even compassion for New York, you don't propose mm. something like this with spikes 30, 40 meters long that I use. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, yes, you take some spectacular pictures. But it is unacceptable. And you'll see, you'll see that because I have here comments of people from New York uh, that uh, couldn't accept it either. So here mm. is the architect. We saw him. Uh, I don't know if I would trust this man. Anyway, um, so New York, New York's four, four, billion, 4 billion shrine to government waste and idiocy. This was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this was the title of, 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 of the article I found. Then another one, to say that Santiago Calatrava, international star architect and grand purveyor of winged white things, is not exactly a media darling, would be an under, under, understatement akin to architecture in China is fairly creative, or Daniel Lipskin mm -hmm. is not quite the most beloved architect around. In March, for example, the New York Times said Calatrava's World Trade Center transit hub, a structural bird in flight set to wrap construction at the end of 2014, had clunky fixtures and some rough work, workmanship that made it look cheap. Of course, before that, the Spanish city of Valencia sued the architect because his grossly over budget opera house was ooh, kind of falling apart. And now the New York Post, Steve, who was a critic that often sticks to restaurant reviews, has unleashed the harshest, most outlandish critique of them all. Here comes the Calatrasaurus. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it was a paleontologist, yeah. <laughs> it is, and it doesn't mellow out from there. Below, a visual tour of the most insane lines from the critique. So now you'll hear some other words about the Calatrasaurus. Mm. A self-indulgent monstrosity, uh, white, of course, but uh, still a monstrosity, 
like plastic mutant terrors of 1950s science fiction movies. Uh, not every everyday ugly like a, a tacky brown tie or dress, but lol ugly. Or may frighten small children. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the form, this one we read, uh, the Shrine to Government Waste and IDOC. I mean, with this, mm. I mean, incredible amounts of money, you know, uh, bureaucracy fed vain glory. Uh, mm. Yeah, bureaucracy fed vain glory. Uh, look at me, I'm Calatrava. Uh, and. Um, what are we pointing at? There? I don't know, actually. Should we call Bruce or I, I don't know what that is, you know. That. I was rushing to see the, the, the great artist doing a, a bucolic little watercolor. It's unbelievable, actually. It is insulting yeah. and it's so ridiculous and it's so pathetic. Mm. Here is the man, you know, dressed with a tie and with a white shirt, you know, with his why is he doing this you know i mean maybe guy, he's only posing for for the picture and there's somebody else that does the watercolors <laughs> maybe but 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 he's he's like somebody else was actually mixing the concrete and he was just posing as if he was doing it right or maybe somebody else did the building i, I don't know he just yeah. does the watercolors <laughs> i don't know but yeah. but it's pathetic really i mean why mm. does new york you know, accept such, uh, such, you know, uh, little gestures of, uh, you know, self uh, promotion, which he doesn't even need. I mean, yeah. could you trust? I, I think that the problem with the process is that they discovered too late that be, they'd been sold a lemon. And uh, at that point, you're kind of committed. You can't, you can't pull up. I would, I would never trust a watercolorist who is dressed like him. I mean, you yeah. know, <laughs> you use a t-shirt and a pair of jeans or whatever, and okay, mm. but not like this. This is clear mm. showmanship. Anyway, it was built. Is that, is that kind of suggesting that the building could be multi-purpose, -pur that, that is space, or that the artist could kind of go and stand on each part and paint or draw or do a watercolor. No, but you know, I don't know. It's, I mean, you could do the transportation hub in a more modest way and in a less vain glory way. You know, it's, it's, it's really you know, the, a waste. It's a waste. The interesting, right. The interesting thing is that if you, uh, if you don't mind going back to a few slides. Uh, there was an interior shot that showed the uh, entrance and the uh, kind of ramp at the top. Yeah. This one? Yeah, that one there. You see that top level where people are standing? That is more or less ground level outside the building. Mm -hmm. And you can almost say that everything above that level is pure waste. <laughs> a lot of waste. <laughs> Mm. Right. But space is space. I think if we, if mm. this is a very busy building, then I think to have lots of a space is a good thing. No, the space is fine, which is why I said down below, below the level of that top platform that you see. You see that upper platform where there are I like do. three yes. people standing. Yes, of course. Yeah. Below that, below that, everything is fine. There are shops, there, there are concourses for people catching trains coming out and so on. But everything that you see outside the building is above that level. Yeah. And uh, it's, oh, it's yeah. a very kind of uh, ostentatious way of uh, enclosing this volume. Mm -hmm. And it costs the government and therefore me as a taxpayer uh, a lot of money. I see. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, just uh, a little distance from here, connected by an underground corridor, was a much more modest transportation build building that uh, that we did with Grimshaw Architect and James Carpenter as an artist, which was delivered on budget. 
is quite nice inside and very functional and not nearly as ostentatious. <laughs> and we named it the Oculus because the, the James Carpenter sculpture, he is like uh, an Oculus to the sky and the sunlight comes through there and creates some nice uh, effects with uh, the glass. Uh, so we called it the Oculus. And then when they opened this, they stole the name from our project. And this is now called the Oculus. And ours remains nameless. It's just called the uh, Fulton Street Transportation Hub. Mm -hmm. So there's something a little personal about this as well, which I'm annoyed about. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. Mm. So everybody seems happy now, you know, uh, when the project was made, but... Uh, I don't know why Daniel Leverskind is standing there applauding. Well, <laughs> you know, he is applauding because um, I, 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 well, he was part of the... He, he, he actually was... Uh, um, he won the, the competition for the master plan initially for this area. So maybe, you know, in the name of that uh, position, he is here present. I don't know, yeah. but uh, anyway, I'm surprised that nobody has actually asked the question about those spikes, you know, because they are so obvious in the project as well. Yeah. Anyway. Well, the, the connection was always between those and wings of a bird taking flight. And it doesn't look anything like a bird taking flight. It looks like a sort of aggressive hedgehog. <laughs> right. It does look like a hedgehog that's drawing mm. stones. Mm. OK, so Garda de Oriente in Lisbon. This one I kind of like a uh, reference yeah, to the Gothic. Nice. Uh, you know, architecture mm. is maybe too literal, too obvious. But, you know, of course he, he has his mannerisms and he cannot get rid of them. And, but, you know, this is a little bit different, I think, than, than, uh, uh, than, than the other work. Well, at least these elements here have a function, right? They're creating the roof. So right, uh, right. It's, uh, it has some, uh, some validity. Lisbon. So we move forward. <clears throat> but it is true after seeing, uh, you know, several buildings by him, by him you could be a little bit uh, tired because it's, it's just too much. Gare de Lyon. Now, obviously, Calatrava. I mean, there's no question about it. And I actually how come he doesn't get tired of himself? Because it's almost a transportation hub in New York, a smaller yeah. and, and less wide, but mm. in essence, it's kind of the same. Yeah. Yeah, actually, now that you show the interior, it's like the same design. Yeah. Mm. Ah, I can't take his watercolors. Okay. Um, now Liege station, they're all mega structures, you know, they're all uh, you know, mm. almost unbearably large. And uh, maybe Mahab, Mahadev could tell us something about, is it in terms of, of, uh, of energy consumption? Is such a building uh, performant? Uh, that's a good question. So, for example, this interior volume here, we don't know whether it is air conditioned or not. One would hope not. Exactly. Uh, like, for example, you have a big volume at Grand Central Station in, uh, in New York, which is not uh, conditioned. And it just maintains a reasonable temperature because of its thermal mass and of all the train activity that's happening uh, below it and adjacent to it. Uh, so if, if this is not conditioned, then it's fine. You know, it's, it's, uh, 
in fact, a very light structure, it looks like, to span over a, a big volume, and it's creating a very uh, attractive space. So in this case, uh, I don't really have a problem with uh, what I see here. Yes, but look at the, at the amount of glass. I mean, there is a lot of glass receiving sunlight through it. There's a lot of glass, and also I'm kind of questioning the way that his positioning is the glass lid bang in the center of this kind of arc. And is, you know, the, the relationship of the train on the platform and the curve of the roof and the smaller elements, they don't kind of harmonize, I think. Mm. And that is where I think it's failing. Okay, the structure is quite interesting, it's something, something, but the rest of it is not, they're not coming together to make something, you know, valuable. And no, but, uh, as Philip Johnson said, and he knew what he was talking about because uh, he lived in the glass house. He said, you know, if you are concerned about uh, the energy bill, don't build with glass not mm. with much glass and here i see a lot of glass you know yeah uh, but that's why that's why i said it depends on whether the volume below is air conditioned or not but but if it was air conditioned what would you estimate oh the then it would be it would be a, it would be a huge uh, huge uh, expensive space but again you see there are ways let's assume that this is not a train station and it's uh, the entrance to an opera house uh the way in which you would deal with that is firstly, you have a lot of structural elements there by orienting them appropriately and with the right depth, you can actually create shading for the glass where the structure itself reduces the amount of heat gain that mm -hmm. comes through the glass roof. So that's the first thing you can do. The second thing you can do is to make sure that you're only trying to condition the zone where the people are. In other words, the lowest two meters closest to the floor. And uh, so you would supply air at low velocity into that space. And you would also use uh, some kind of a pipe system in the floor with chilled water flowing through that. Of course, not such a, at such a low temperature because you don't want condensation to form on the floor, but sufficiently low so that you can pick up the radiant heat from the roof right at source and stop it heating up the, the space inside the building. So there are various tricks that we have as mechanical engineers to deal with volumes like this without a ridiculous uh, expenditure of energy. If you try to condition a volume like this with, with full sun using the conventional means of blowing a lot of cold air inside, then you know, you'd, uh, you'd be wasting a lot of money. And Philip Johnson was right. Thank you. Well, he was half right. He was half right because it's uh, it's glass that's exposed to the sun, which is the expensive thing. Glass that's shaded from the sun is is a little better, and glass that's uh, double air to shade it from the cold is better still. Thank you. Well, this is a project for London. I don't know if it was, if, if the construction started. No, it's not. You see the Millennium uh, work by uh, yeah. by Sir Richard Rogers. So it's, it's not far away from it at all. Which is the Calatrava bit? That bit in white in the middle? Yes. No. But uh, maybe, I don't know, this one is for sure. I think we, I have other images here. Uh, it should be that one. Even a bridge, of course, uh, look, no hands. Um, mm. Yeah, this one. Oh, okay. But well, compared to many of the other things we have seen, this is quite subdued. Yes, it is subdued, but uh, it's Still, I, I don't know when I look at this, where is this in the Arab world or I, 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 I don't know where it is. Yeah. He, he ignores completely, uh, you know, the cultural context, the physical context. It's, 
you know, it could be anywhere, really. Mm. Why yeah. is it that the three towers are all the same size, the same height, you know? The, the composition of the elements are banal. Mm. Yeah. Now we arrive at the, the longest cantilever in the world. I think it's 78 meters. Uh, another, you know, uh, why did he- Is this a real project or a fantasy? No, no, it was built. Oh my God. Yes, it was built. In the, I know that this uh, picture was uh, was in your in invitation for this. Uh, right. And I looked at it and thought, my God, that's a monster. Well, it was built in the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, affected Brazil. Um, it, it was built. And, and again, you know, it's, it's uh, impressive visually at the first sight. But then again, what, what is its meaning? What, what does it do? Is really all that uh, cantilever part is, is nothing really. It's yeah. 78 meters. Wow. <laughs> now, maybe the next step would be, as Kenneth Frampton would say, uh, agro urbanism and uh, harvesting rainwater. Because Frampton is very skeptical about this uh, optimistic, uh, you know, uh, exploiting uh, the resources of the earth at infinitum. It is not going to work. We have to stop. So in the long mm -hmm. run, I think these successes by Akala Trava and others, I'm afraid will, will, uh, will come to an abrupt end and uh, yeah. it might not be the happiest end at all. You yeah. know, it, it only shows how, how, how you know, uh, self-defeating we are, you know, because this was not built too long ago. And you know, Brazil has a lot of poverty and there, yeah, are, there is so much yeah. poverty in the world in general. And you spend again, large amounts of money. I mean, really this, this Calatrava, is, uh, is uh, can can be uh, you know ask certain questions you know how responsible are you as an architect you know mm -hmm. eating up so much resources for what you know really for what because this this is not really human glory or cultural uh, great cultural achievement this is just a show a tour de force that that uh, you know milks the, the the resources of the world. Uh, in, in, in terrible ways. So this, it's a, it's a, I think it's a sick way of showing our optimism and our belief mm. in so-called progress. You know. Yeah. You know, yeah. I read somewhere somebody was amusing about in 200 years' time, uh, people are going to look back over this era, over this era, and they'll either have the reaction, "Wow, that was a golden age when they could do some really cool stuff." Or it's like, what the hell were they thinking? <laughs> I have a feeling that the latter is going to be the, the more common reaction. Right. Hmm. You know what Albert Einstein said? He was asked, do you know how the Third World War will be fought with? And he said, I don't know how the Third World War will be fought, but I know how the Fourth World War will be fought. He said, with sticks and stones. Ah, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe we should attend this apocalyptic uh, mm. tone, but uh, Calatrava is really irresponsible. I'm not against irresponsibility uh, when it brings joy, but, but to, 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 to spend such huge amounts of money for uh, frivolous gestures mm. of uh, uh, an omnipotence that maybe hides uh, deeply seated uh, vulnerability, because this mm. superiority complex hides an inferiority complex. Yeah, is the the well known uh, Napoleon complex. Mm. Uh, and I chose this picture because I like it because you see two different kinds of freedom. One is that is contrived and is in essentially fake, and then you have here a man throwing himself into the water and mm. accepts his freedom and his movement and his being alive without uh, 
uh, you know, uh, eating up uh, resources in any way. Mm. Plus, I think his being alive is much more convincing than the building. Mm. Anyway, another glorious uh, empty gesture. But, but it is impressive. And he, he also has these uh, moving wings, you know, uh, that, that open up and, and cover uh, certain parts of the roof. How low. Oh, really? On, on top of all this, things move? Yes. Oh, God. Didn't you see yeah. this? Oh, so, right. Yes. Yeah. Incredible. He did his game again, just like in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He doesn't get tired of these things. Hmm. Anyway. Um, well, there's think, no need for him to get tired of it. The question is, when is when are the clients going to get tired of it? Well, you know, the clients want to have a Calatrava, you know, uh, hmm. Calatrava building, so they, they will go through hell to, to have hmm. it. And, but I look at this person, how lonely she, she must feel, you know, with this monstrosity uh, not far away from her, you know. Um, yeah, I would appreciate much more uh, an old bazaar, you know, in, uh, in somewhere in, in, in northern Africa, or, you know, built with simple means. And and, and then where we, well, yes, we have the pandemic now, but uh, you know, under normal conditions, uh, an architecture that that says yes to life and not to mm. grandiosity. Mm. Anyway. Look at it, it eats you up. You know, it's almost uh, Ahab's, Ahab's uh, well, you know, it, or Jonah's well, it, it wants to yeah. swallow you up. Okay, in New York City. In fact, that, that big uh, semicircular thing there looks like the intake to a jet engine. Uh, to suck you into it. Right. I mean, in, in New York, you okay. You use the metaphor of the white dove and so on. But here, what 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 was this for? I'm I'm curious. I don't know enough about the building, but uh, you know, uh, that's why I chose to, those two images for the invitation to the to the mm -hmm. presentation because they show. Sigurd Leverance with the smallest of means creating meaning, and this with a you know an incredible uh, effort to to create I would say less meaning. Hmm. Anyway, uh, that's it. Uh, I'm not going to go into studio gang now. So okay. We we did it. It's uh, it's uh, four hours after we started, so we did uh, go a little bit through Swedish architecture, through Zygmunt Leverenz and Gunnar Asplund, and we also, uh, uh, you know, yesterday was Calatrava's birthday, so we did it. And I want to thank you that uh, you know here there are still seven people besides me who um, you know went through this uh, you know long uh, long uh, you know presentation uh, so you know thank you uh, dan we really appreciate your efforts to no but together. no uh, I, I actually i i do have to to to, to acknowledge uh, the significance of your presence with very informed and, and generous and sometimes even uh, you know uh, joyous and even you know humorous comments i think you are great 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 uh, contributor to our uh, to our uh, gatherings. I think no, the nice others would agree with me. So I thank you, but I think everybody else uh, here thanks you. And uh, I also, you know, maybe in Ande one day we'll also have the chance to have Bruce and you together and uh, with a dialogue between you two. And uh, we'll see the, the, the month of August will start soon with uh, you know, some interesting celebrations. And like always, I invite anybody who wants to make a presentation herself or himself, uh, let's do it. For example, tomorrow, uh, David uh, uh, Castaniena, uh, 
I hope I have his family name correct. The Portuguese architect will make a presentation about a very important uh, Portuguese architect, which he was supposed to make a few days ago, but because I was ill, we couldn't do it. So we'll do it tomorrow. Uh, and uh, then a, a pause for a few days. And on the 3rd of August, we'll start with um, Antoine Picon and uh, Ornament in Architecture. And uh, it will be an interesting discussion about mm -hmm. ornament in architecture and about his contributions to uh, the contemporary uh, discourse on the relevance of ornament today in architecture. So if you are not uh, yet tired of these uh, presentations, we'll go on. I, I am I'm very grateful that uh, these some people uh, express uh, continuous interest. Dan, thank you very much for a very, very interesting, engaging and informing presentation. It's fully appreciated. I'm afraid I have to go, but I look forward to meeting you tomorrow. Okay, so thank you. Okay, thank bye, Azad. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Uh, I'm going as well now. So, and, uh, and feel better, Dan. I hope the, the spider's uh, venom is uh, losing its grip on you. I hope, but uh, I think it will be a long thing. But I, you know, as long as uh, I can, uh, I can still talk and be with you. It's I feel uh, that my day is not lost. So thank you very much for for being yeah. present, and uh, we'll see each other soon again. Indeed, or tomorrow, one of the next days. Yes. Yeah, probably not tomorrow, but we shall see. Okay. 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 Thank okay. you. Bye bye. Bye. There is a person here I do not know, uh, Corky Cunningham. Maybe if you hear me, could you tell us who you are, if you don't don't mind? Well, maybe you know some people leave the, you know, maybe he or she is not here any longer. How did okay. you feel today? Uh, how is uh, your leg? Uh, Andre, um, I don't know. I I hope I'm not wrong that it is the spider who who did this. Um, it, it doesn't look too good, but uh, what is good is that I don't think I have fever. So uh, also that thing, the redness didn't expand, but it was or it is and still is. Uh, no, it covers a, a, a large area of, of my leg. I, I think I am a little bit better because I, I, I know that until yesterday, if I got up from the bed and I tried to go to the kitchen, there was an excruciating pain uh, uh, after making a few steps, truly unbearable. In fact, I almost fell to the ground. But then after a short while, you know, still with a pain, but but less, less, uh, less powerful. Now I can, at this point, I can, I can get up from the bed and, uh, and uh, work to the kitchen. Yes, with pain in my leg, but without that very, very sharp um, pain. So I, I hope it's getting better, but very, very, very slowly. And did so, you take the medication recommended by the doctor? 